meeting to order. Uh, good afternoon everyone. Uh, my name is Janet Rutledge. I am the MLA for Burnaby North and the chair of the Select Standing Committee on Finance and Government Services, a committee of the Legislative Assembly that includes MLAs from the government and opposition parties. I would like to acknowledge that we are meeting this afternoon in Kamloops, which is located on the traditional territories of the Tkumloops, So. Wepmuk within the traditional lands of the Sewepmuk people. In making this acknowledgement today, I'd like to take time to remember and honour the 215 children who were found on the grounds of the former Kamloops Indian Residential School, as well as all the children who didn't make it home. We have a collective responsibility to learn and face this truth as part of the journey of reconciliation. I would also like to welcome everyone who is listening to and participating in today's meeting on the Budget 2022 consultation. Our committee is currently seeking input on priorities for the next provincial budget. In addition to these meetings, British Columbians can share their views by making written comments or by filling out the online survey. Details are available on our website at bcledge.ca forward slash FGS budget. The deadline for all input is this Thursday, September 30th, 2021 at 5 p.m. We will carefully consider all input and make recommendations to the Legislative Assembly, <coughs> pardon me, to the Legislative Assembly on what should be included in Budget 2022. The committee intends to release its report in November. For this afternoon's meeting, all presenters will be making individual presentations. Each presenter has five minutes for their presentation, followed by five minutes for questions from committee members. All audio from our meetings is broadcast live on our website and a complete transcript will also be posted. I'll now ask the members of the committee to introduce themselves. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, my name is Ben Stewart, and I'm the MLA from Kelowna West. Um, I just want to say how uh, humbled we are to be here on the Tecumloops uh, traditional territory and the uh, uh, findings that uh, occurred several months back, and we look forward to the Day of Reconciliation being celebrated on Thursday. So thank you, and look forward to your presentations. Hello everyone, I'm Harvinder Sandhu, MLA for Vernon Monashi, coming to you from the unceded and traditional territory of the Okanagan Indian Nations, and I do recognize uh, the discoveries, uh, devastating discoveries of 215 children, and you know, uh, hoping to have this dialogue moving forward on 30th September, so thank you for being here. Good afternoon, I'm Mike Starchuk, MLA for Surrey Cloverdale, which is located on the traditional unceded lands of the uh, Coast Salish people, which include the Keitsi, Semiamu, and Kwantlen. Good afternoon, my name is Greg Kyle. I'm the MLA for Shuswap, and I'm also the uh, BC Liberal critic for Labour. My name is Megan Dykeman. I am the MLA for Langley East. It's an honour to be here, and I'm looking forward to everybody's presentations today. My name is Jagroop Brad. I'm the MLA for Surrey Fleetwood. Hi, everybody. I am Lauren Dirksen, and I am the MLA for Caribou Chilcotin, and also pleased to be here in Kamloops. I am also the critic for rural development. Assisting the committee today are uh, Jennifer Errol, Stephanie Raymond from the Parliamentary Committee's office, and Amanda Heffelfinger and Simon Delat from Hansard Services. So uh, I think we are ready to begin our first uh, of um, quite a few presentations today. So uh, 
Uh, the first presenter is Daniel Mills, a Kamloops Symphony. So Daniel, you can come to the table. Uh, you have five minutes. Uh, we will give you a 30 second warning so that you know that it's time to wrap up. All right. Good afternoon. Uh, uh. Dear members of the committee, thank you so much for being here today. As mentioned, my name is Daniel Mills, and I am the executive director of the Kamloops Symphony, and I'd like to welcome you to Kamloops Shishwepmik within the unceded traditional lands of Shishwepmik peoples. Thank you so much for coming here today, and it's nice to see you in person. I stepped into this role about two years ago and had, have had very little face-to-face in -face interaction with uh, members of the provincial government, so thank you. So traditionally, the Kamloops Symphony delivers over 7,000 annual ticketed experiences to those in interior BC through our core programming of professional orchestral concerts. Led by our own music director, Dina Gilbert, we, along with a network of other regional orchestras in BC, are a major provider of work for freelance musicians in the province and enriching musical experiences for the community. Like most professional arts organizations in BC, we are very fortunate to receive provincial operating funding from both the BC Arts Council as well as BC Gaming through their community gaming grants. Both support our core programming in critical ways and allow us to deliver meaningful experiences. As such, we are very much in support of the government's continued funding of the BC Arts Council to allow organizations like us to pursue relevant programming for our region, particularly programs to better reach all members of the community Similarly, we also call for the continuation of the Community Gaming Grants program. This past year, like so many organizations, we made a rapid transition to digital programming, being one of the first in the province to offer online ticketed concerts last fall and converting our traditional season to one that was fully online. Although it took a substantial amount of administrative work and creativity, we were ultimately able to launch a a nine full concert experiences, the same number as a typical season. We would like to express our gratitude for the Arts and Culture Resilience Supplement made available through the BC Arts Council in late 2020 and again in the spring of 21, as we grappled with the transition to online models where ticketing revenues were about 10% of our normal levels. This emergency funding, along with supports from other levels of government, was crucial to our sustainability. Just this past weekend, we were thrilled to welcome in-person audiences back for the opening of our 21-22 season uh, with help of my colleague Evan Clausen, who will be presenting shortly from Western Canada Theatre. Although patrons who came were delighted to be there and were very good at adhering to the multiple protocols we had in place, the experience was also very telling of where we are at as of today. Even though we are now allowed 50% capacity in performance spaces, this does not mean that we can easily fill this 50%. Many people are understandably reluctant to return to live group settings and being unable to access them for so long, some because they're not ready and others because they're simply out of the habit. Thus, our current challenge is how to return to somewhat normal sized programming, which engages with over 40 artists per concert, when we have limited means to recoup the costs through ticket sales like we did pre-pandemic. This likely means tough decisions ahead in terms of programming and the size and scope of what we can offer. Thus, we ask the BC government to commit to further transitionary support to both arts organizations and individual artists so we can retain cultural workers in the province within the arts industry. We are also advocating for funding and action towards normalizing attendance at performing arts events to help spread the message that performing arts presentations are a safe place to be. Finally, COVID-19 aside, the lack of music-specific performance space continues to be a major limiting factor for the Kamloops Symphony and many other arts groups in terms of availability and flexibility of use. A proposed Kamloops Center for the Arts was to be a new home for us, both as a concert venue, but also home for our outreach programs. Although the municipal referendum in Kamloops for this project in April 2020 was postponed indefinitely due to the pandemic, I firmly believe this project is still very much needed for Kamloops. As such, I am highly encouraging that this committee consider future support of major fund infrastructure sp spending, particularly towards the creation of cultural spaces, such as the proposed Kamloops Centre for the Arts. Although performance venues may have gone through a relatively inactive period over the last 18 months, I believe that this industry will be back and the people of British Columbia will have the need for cultural spaces more than ever. To sum up my submiss submission, I therefore urge the committee to consider the following four actions in their next budget. One, commit to continued support for the BC Arts Council and BC Gaming Grants. Two, offer transitionary support to both cultural organizations and artists to aid with reopening. 
Three, support the promotion of attending performing arts presentations as a safe activity. And four, commit to infrastructure spending for large projects, particularly cultural spaces. Thank you kindly for your time and consideration and all you do for the people of British Columbia. Together, we can ensure that this pro province continues offering outstanding artistic experiences to its residents. Thank you. Thank you, Daniel. Uh, now I'll ask uh, members of uh, the committee, they have uh, questions. Mike. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, Daniel. Um, I think there's a, there's a bunch of us that are just clawing at your doors, waiting to get inside <laughs> and actually see something and hear something in person. Um, but the, the third ask that I want to make sure I, I've got it clear is the communications efforts to pr promote a safe venue. Um, how do you see that unfolding? I think this could be in various ways. I, I realize a little bit out of some of the, the purview of this committee particularly, but we're looking at helping spread that message and whether it is funding to help the communications effort but, or just being champions yourselves as, uh, as people to recommend that the arts practice our safe place to go back to. Uh, we believe that a word of mouth and and kind of at um, ground level campaigns are probably the, the biggest way that we can get people back to audiences safely. As we saw with this past weekend, we're just encouraging people to get the word out and having funding and support to do that is a way that we feel that will have the most success. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Megan. And thank you for your presentation. I was wondering, uh, looking forward, uh, as we come out of the pandemic and things are able to open up, what do you project as being the length of time it's going to take to recover and for finances to maybe look back to pre-pandemic levels if you're doing forecasting? I mean, it's possible to say particularly, but I, I would hope that by next September in 2022, we are looking at something a bit more similar to what we normally offer in terms of the number of artists and the size of our programming and as well as the people that are coming back to us. Of course, we have a lot of changes with us exploring to digital models going forward. Uh, some of those those models have definitely changed for the better in a lot of cases, but uh, I'm hoping that our budget looks a bit more normal in terms of the regular ratios of spending. And you didn't have now. to dip too much into no. reserves or anything? No, and f fortunately with emergency supports, we are in a relatively stable financial position, but okay. ultimately it was a lot of the, the individual artists that were the ones who unfortunately got the short end of the, the deal with this. Um, we are okay as an organization, mm -hmm. but we weren't able to hire as many people as normal. Understandable. Okay, that's good to know. Thank you so much. It's your group. Yeah, well, thank you, Daniel. Uh, COVID-19 has, of course, we all know, impacted uh, every aspect of our life and continue to do so. And uh, we don't know uh, where is the end. So um, hopefully it will be soon, <laughs> but we don't know. So transition back to normal life is, of course, is very important to us. And, um, you know, bringing back the economy, uh, various sectors are uh, important to all of us. And so you mentioned one of the, uh, I think, second or third bullet in your uh, four recommendations, uh, transition sub transitional support to cultural association. If you can expand on that a little bit more, that will be helpful as to what kind of support you are suggesting. I think... Uh I mean, whether it is through regular operating funding through some of the other programs or specific initiatives that encourage communication campaigns that, you know, we can use to help get that message across that, that the arts are still here and thriving. Uh, so I think it can either be in a general financial sense, uh, but it could also potentially look like something that is geared towards more of a, a marketing push. I, I hate to use that word specifically, but more of an advocacy approach to uh, funding our messaging. That helps. Thank you. Okay, well, oh, Harwinder. Thank you, thank you, Chair. Thank you, Daniel, for your presentation. My question is asked by MLA Brad, but I'm wondering, will you be uh, presenting written submission to us? Uh, perhaps you did. My internet is a bit oh, no. slow. I have not submitted, but I, I will submit exactly what I said today. Okay, thank you so much. <laughs> yeah. appreciate it. Okay, well, with, uh, with that, uh, Daniel, well, thank you for your presentation and thank you for your advocacy. Uh, I, for one, um, uh, am, um, really need to get back uh, to, uh, uh, to 
in-person performances. I tried during the pandemic to uh, to engage online, and I found it very hard. And your point um, that you know we are all out of the habit um, really resonated mm-hmm. with me. Uh, so I think uh, we all have to kind of pull together uh, in order to um, uh, get back to creating the energy uh, uh, that is so important to us all in live performances. So thank you very thank much. Thank you very much. Have a wonderful afternoon. And our next presenter is uh, Evan Klassen, Western Canada Theatre. All right. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Chair Rutledge and committee members. Uh, my name is Evan Clausen. I'm the Managing Director at Western Canada Theatre. WCT is Kamloops and the BC Southern Interior's regional theatre company. And we are grateful to be able to live, work, and tell stories on the traditional unceded territories of Tecumseh Tishkwetmik, a territory whose name has greater resonance now following the discoveries of last June, and especially this week as we approach the National Day for Truth and Reconciliation. Thank you so much for being here in person. The committee's presence in Kamloops is always appreciated. I also bring greetings on behalf of our artistic director, James McDonald, our chair, Tim Rogers, and our entire board and staff. Uh, This is at least the fifth annual submission that we have made to this committee. Uh, And as in the past, we are pleased to share this presentation with our colleagues at the Kamloops Symphony and with us today in spirit only, uh, the Kamloops Art Gallery. The arts are critical to a vibrant, healthy British Columbia. And throughout this pandemic, we've seen British Columbians turn to creative outlets to help with their mental health, physical well-being, emotional support, and to provide important occasions to come together. As a theatre company with the mandate to gather audiences in the act of storytelling together, we take that social mandate as a call to action. And yet, 19 months in, the arts in the interior of BC are struggling. We're mid-fourth wave. Our venues are slowly reopening to capacity to 50% capacity. There are ever-evolving health orders. We toil dil- diligently to provide safe environments, and we respond to legitimate audience hesitancy to return to our spaces. Just because we are now able to see 50% capacity doesn't mean that audiences are ready. Activity levels are somewhat low. Organizations are planning and replanning. Artist engagements are down. And we as a sector are still not able to earn revenue in a meaningful way. Ongoing sustained recovery funding is going to be needed in the coming months and over multiple years. The BC Arts Council's Resilience Supplement, Major Tourism Anchor Attractions Grant, the Fairs and Festivals and Events Grant have all had really significant positive impacts on our sector, but there is a long road ahead and more significant recovery funding will be needed. Perhaps an approach that might be useful would be a kind of arts new deal in which supports to the arts and cultural sector could include three prongs, sustained operating funding, a focus on fostering increased employment and engagement of artists and capacity building, and a strong focus on arts infrastructure and support to the physical environments that we find ourselves in. WCT is a grateful recipient of BC Arts Council operating funding, and this funding has been essential over the course of the pandemic in allowing us to operate, to engage artists, and to create content virtually for our regional audience. BC Arts Council's uh, strategic plan with its focus on equity, diversity, and access, Indigenous engagement, and regional arts development provides us all, organizations and artists alike, with an essential mandate to aspire to and work towards. It is for this reason that we continue to advocate for, as we have in years past, for the completion of the doubling of the BC Arts Council budget and to provide sustained multi-year funding to arts organizations across the province. A second prong of funding is to build capacity within the arts and cultural sector, especially as we create projects and programs to engage in Indigenous reconciliation, partner with diverse audiences and artists. Arts organizations in the interior specifically need support to develop leadership capacity to help diversify our staff and artists, many of whom do not live here and have to travel from larger centers. These engagements can mean significant costs to organizations. We also need capacity building funding to be paired with that operating funding in order to achieve the specific aims of authentic engagement while ensuring that organizations remain stable. And that third and final uh, approach is around the physical infrastructure of the arts and cultural sector. As Daniel mentioned, it's no secret that at the outset of the pandemic, we were on the cusp of building a new art center, which which would have been a future home for the theater company as well as the symphony and gallery. 
And as the project readies itself for another attempt, it is essential that significant funds are dedicated to large-scale capital infrastructure projects such as this, along with smaller-scale equipment and project funding, such as that undertaken by the BC Arts Council's Arts Infrastructure Program. It is our hope that BC will lean into these funding needs as priorities in the coming budgets to get British Columbians, artists, and arts workers back into our theatres to see our audience re returning in droves and to see a vibrant and healthy BC thrive once more. Thank you so much for your time this afternoon. Thank you, Evan. And I'll invite uh, members of the committee to ask questions. Ben. Uh, thanks very much, Evan. I just uh, I would like to know more about the Kamloops Center for the Arts. Um, Daniel mentioned that the there was postponed in April of 2020, and I guess my question is: is was there a commitment from government to partner with the city, the arts community, uh, and is that uh, in question right now, or was it never there? And if not, what would it look like? For the future if it was to go ahead. The reason I ask that is that both of you mentioned that there's this hesitancy by the patrons to maybe come out and of course if there's a plebiscite or a vote on this are they going to be as you know kind of there for you when you need it? Yeah, so uh, thank you for the question. Uh, we, had, we had formed a nonprofit society which was comprised of the arts organizations, a number of community business leaders, and the city of Kamloops uh, to lead us towards a referendum. That was supposed to be April of 2020. And of course, as you know, March hit, uh, and the referendum was postponed and then cancelled due to you know, the circumstances that the city found itself in as a municipal government. Um, they weren't prepared to sort of step into that fray. And so the, the public the sort of court of public opinion has not yet been settled. However, in the course of establishing that nonprofit organization to actually advance the cause, we were able to, I think, achieve like about 5,000 members, over 5,000 members from within Kamloops uh, who were in support of that project. And so we were, we were looking very optimistically to that uh, referendum. However, in this moment, I, the, the point is well taken that there is certain hesitancy right now around coming back to large gatherings. Obviously, we know that we will get there eventually, um, but to ask the question now is certainly a, a real debate as to what the timing would be. Of course, we're heading to a municipal election in the next fall, and so there's a chance that, that might, it might become a question on that ballot for the city's uh, consideration. But ultimately, the conversations need to start happening at the provincial and federal levels, um, and both of those... Um, uh, both of our elected re officials in, in, at those two levels certainly have been aware. Um, we have a new MP, of course, in this area uh, to bring up to speed, but we certainly have made our, our outgoing MP very aware of this project. It's just the question of, like, what is the next step uh, and what is the case for support? There were certainly businesses that were in the, way, in the offing uh, with their support. They just weren't, you know, they, we need the right step to move forward. We need that anchor funding to be in place to move that piece forward. Um, and certainly if it was coming from the province, I think that would be a, a welcome step. Thank you. Thank you. As your group. Thank you, Evan. Um, tourism, arts and culture, I think were, were the hardest hit uh, during the COVID and continue to be the case where a uh, significant majority of the organization actually came to standstill. There was no, there were no activity going on, as you know, um, because of the fear of the COVID-19 and there were no customers for you guys. Uh, the government did provide significant support during this phase uh, and continue to do so. I would like to know from you, Nick, what kind of support you got and was that helpful? And uh, so what your uh, recommending moving forward. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, Western Canada Theatre has received operating funding from the BC Arts Council. We also received uh, the resilience supplements. I think there were two phases of that that happened through the BC Arts Council as well. Uh, we did not receive the anchor attractions funding, but our colleague at the arts at the art gallery did receive that funding. Um, and so those pieces were very instrumental in keeping us here. I, I've said from the outset that if it were not for those funding pieces and the Canadian wage subsidy, that 
our staff and our organization would not be here at this moment to be able to make this presentation to you. Uh, and certainly as we look forward, the piece that is most concerning for us is our, there's now as we reopen, there's an expectation that we will return to normal levels. We are doing full productions starting in late November, early December. But if we're not able to earn that revenue, if we're not able to make that money in a, in a meaningful way in earned revenue, it has to come from somewhere. We're going to start seeing some significant deficits. Um, um, as an organization, like Daniel mentioned, we are in a, in, a, in a stable financial picture at this exact moment. But if we start going into seasons of production where we're going to see handfuls of audiences attending, we, our business model relies on 60% of our 700-seat theater to be full. If we're barely achieving 40, 30 percent, that's going to be a real significant shortfall for us. And so I think the resilience funding model that BC Arts Council had employed was a really strong one. Um, it certainly was able to reach those clients of BC Arts Council, like Western Canada Theatre, uh, very quickly and easily and readily. And we were so grateful to that support, absolutely. Um, mm -hmm. And I would I would encourage a similar kind of approach as we go forward in terms of that ongoing recovery funding being more longer term in nature and maybe less uh, bespoke at the moment that it occurred. Thank you. Uh, well, um, we are out of time, uh, Evan. Uh, so I would like to um, thank you for your presentation. And um, uh, thank you for starting your presentation by uh, um, acknowledging that, um, that this is where you live, work, and tell stories. And uh, when you refer to what you're asking for as an arts new deal, um, that tells a big story. Yeah, thank you. A very powerful story. Thank you. Thanks so much. Have a good afternoon. You too. And our next presenter is uh, Danielle Asinot. Uh, BC Agriculture Council. So Danielle, you have uh, five minutes. Uh, we will keep, uh, uh, keep track with our phones. And when uh, uh, you have 30 seconds left, uh, we'll signal to you so that you know that it's time to wrap up. Okay. Thank you. Good afternoon, Madam Chair and committee members. Thank you for having me here today in person. My name is Danielle Sinot from BC Agriculture Council, and uh, I am proud to say that we are the industry advocate on behalf of key sector-wide priorities for agriculture in British Columbia. BCAC, as an umbrella organization, represents 26 commodity associations, all farmer-led, and collectively, I, like I said, I proudly sit here representing approximately 96% 90 of all farm gate sales in British Columbia. Creating unified voice for our members is at the core of what we do, and we do this by facilitating dialogue between our member associations for the, po for the core purpose of advocating, adv advancing public policy to contribute towards an environment that, business, that farmers and ranchers can do business. What I'd like to share with you today is some of our, rather than hat in hand, is more so some of the things that we are working on in the short term that, that we feel have some overlap with some of your Core, some of government's core priorities, and hopefully there can be some uh, collaboration efforts in those regards as well. So our key priorities, to not anybody's surprise, I'm sure, is climate change and environmental sustainability, water security and storage, and farm worker care. The agriculture sector is continually working on initiatives related to climate change and environmental sustainability, but there were two that I wanted to highlight today. Newly de being developed is called Ag Clean. And this is an acronym for the Agricultural GHG Commitment to Lowering Emissions by Approaching Net Zero. Ag Cleans, this is industry's strategic plan for how we can sequester carbon or reduce GHGs without uh, putting food security at risk. This work actually aligns quite timely with uh, Clean BC's timelines, and we are already working with government staff to see how we can collaborate with one another and support each other's plans. Secondly, is in regards to the federal government's agriculture climate solutions funding, we industry did a joint application and we were, I'm happy to say that we were successful. And we are working together right now to make an application for phase two of the funding, which would implement a living labs model here in British Columbia for the first time. 
The most important part of anything related to environmental sustainability and climate change initiatives is that it has to be producer-driven and have producer input if at the end of the day you want producer adoption. So we use that as our mantra whenever we're looking at these initiatives and I encourage government to do the same. In regards to water, for farmers and ranchers next to land, water is the most critical resource. And I ask the question not for you to answer, but for thought to pro for thought provoking purposes, and that is if food security truly is a high important factor for this government, then I guess we ask why are not equal efforts being made to secure water for the purposes of food security. Farmers already are impacted by irrigation curtailment and hotter, drier summers are only going to mean that we rely more heavily on irrigation, not precipitation, for our crops. In some watersheds, farmers are having to cut off their water in order to maintain water levels to benefit fish populations and therefore threatens food security. The Climate Preparedness and Adaptation Strategy identifies the creation of a water security strategy and within that strategy government could ensure that water security for agricultural purposes is prioritized and could ensure that consultation and input solicited from industry is is incorporating during its development we believe that collaborative efforts can prevent regions from being in a position where they must choose between between fish, fish population and maintaining a food supply protection of water for fish and wildlife is important and with the proper investment in planning, it doesn't necessarily have to be uh, an, an either or, it could be both. Last but certainly not least is, in relate, is related to farm worker care. First, we would like to thank the provincial government for continuing the centralized quarantine facilities for, tempor for temporary workers entering British Columbia. This has meant a lot to farmers. Secondly, before the pandemic, our organization was working with the provincial government through a joint working group on multiple labor related priorities. As a result, we would like to, we have suggested that a mid season inspection is something for the government to consider. The purpose of this inspection is to encourage both the employer and employees to properly maintain the housing in the condition in which it was approved. All we need right now is a green light on that. We're happy to support the process. In closing, thank you very much for inviting comments to support the work that you're doing to, for British Columbians. And with the last memory, I'll just say, Think back to the empty grocery store shelves. <laughs> I know it was scary for us, but let's learn a lesson from that and prepare accordingly. Thank you, Danielle. Um, and now I'll ask uh, if the committee has questions. Lauren. We all agree Lauren goes first. <laughs> Lucky me. Thank you very much for the presentation. Um, I, too, am concerned about... Uh, uh, what's happening around regulations uh, with with respect to water. I just wondered if you could expand on what you were talking about people or farmers being uh, You know cut off from from that supply. Could you expand on that a little bit? Yeah, I can give an example So the Kuxila River was an example of that this summer and there were five other there were five fish protection orders implemented um, in British Columbia this summer and the Kuxila in specifically we did um, have to curtail water, so they did have to stop uh, watering, irrigating their crops uh, for the purposes of fish protection. So there was a drastic drop in water levels just when the heat spiked, and we saw that water level drop and the taps got cut off. So there were impacts, of course, due to financial impacts, and um, so that, that is one example. We have seen the exact same thing in the caribou where I'm from where we had probably some of the wettest spring on record and absolutely bone dry creeks uh, now. So it's a, it's a massive concern. What about uh, the regulation around underground water? <laughs> the regulation, what, from my understanding, the red tape on the the groundwater licensing and the underground water is being further reduced over the years. And 
is that specifically what you're asking about? I guess uh, just how much are your members running into it now? Commercial operations need to register their wells now, and I believe that has to be done by 2022. It's a massive issue in certainly the Caribou and, and other rural areas. I just wondered where your members were on that. Well, in regards to the groundwater licensing, yeah, it's um, it has been fraught with challenges, and where they're at are, I'm sure... My colleague behind me will speak very specifically to his uh, respective commodity. And um, the problem is, is that the process is so backlogged. It's so, the support isn't there. We, we can't get, we still have, I think, 15,000 wells that still are not, um, that there hasn't been an applicant. They're not registered. There's not an application in the system for it yet. And the system just there's been a lot of challenges. I, I don't know how we're going to make the 20, the March 2022 deadline. It's, it's probably not going to happen the way that we want it to. We have requested, uh, we have talked about a deadline. We have offered our support again to help with communication efforts. And um, we've been told that there isn't additional funding to, to work on communication efforts. And so we're just waiting it out right now to see how it goes. We're, we're trying, we've been communicating with producers continually on an ongoing basis that the deadline is coming and um, we're at a bit of a standstill, I'm afraid. Thank you. So we have three more questions, uh, Jagrup, Ben and Megan, and we have about a minute and a half left. Okay. Be quick, uh, Daniel, thank you very much. Uh, the uh, you know good thing is we have good economy and low unemployment, but that causes, of course, challenges. We need more workers. So we have a massive inflow of temporary foreign workers into the country, and that creates different problems uh, or issues um, during COVID-19. So um, if you can a little bit tell, tell me more about the housing situation you're talking about. I know there's a contract between the, um, the farmers uh, and the... Uh, uh, the government providing certain kind of housing to those to those workers, and uh, as you mentioned, probably the, and that is not people not living up to that, right? So, the second one is we have centralized uh, quarantine facility, which you mentioned, which I think we are funding for that one. You want to continue that as long as the COVID-19 is around us. Yes. So, to the second part, yes, as long as uh, we can continue having those quarantine facilities, would would be excellent and we would very much appreciate that. In regards to your first question, um, the housing inspections, what's happening is um, a housing inspector comes in initially prior to workers arriving and it gets inspected and it, it, when it is approved we want to ensure that mid-season that there is an inspection that comes in to ensure that both it's a man, maintaining um, expectations on both sides for the employer and for the employee that the housing is maintained in the where it was originally approved. So you're looking for more that everybody is taking care of it. You're looking for more enforcement after approval. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Uh, ben and uh, then Megan and I would point out that we're past our five minutes. Uh, Danielle, <laughs> thanks for the presentation. <laughs> You know what? We could talk all afternoon on these type of things here, and I do. I commend you just on terms of being succinct in the three items, etc. And I know the farm worker issue that we had wasn't just British Columbia challenges. I, we did speak with the BC Ag Council because, as a group of producers, there was a wide gap between Ottawa and British Columbia. Um, the groundwater one, and I guess what I'm kind of having been in agriculture most of my life. I know that the use of water is something that, um, you know, we could probably always do more with some of the research and stuff like that. I see in our presentation on in Richmond, Ted Vandergloek is speaking to us in Richmond, and I know Ted's work, etc. I do think that there is a, a, there's a case to be made that we could utilize water perhaps more efficiently, and I don't know the answers for the different crops and commodities and stuff like that. But anyways, uh, I just wanted to, you know, when you mentioned the 15,000 wells, et cetera, and the backlog and stuff like that, I can just see, um, you know, the uh, people that are out there that are going to struggle with that. So um, hopefully we can help you with 
the answers to some of these things. But anyways, um, I don't really have a question. I just, you know, I think that it's good that you're bringing those up, and we do need to deal with those. And probably your um, climate action commitment is a big deal. And I think that the government needs to recognize that you're willing to do what's necessary. So thank you. Thank you. And I will be submitting a more formal submission on the other side of this to speak to more of the specifics that I briefly touched on today. <laughs> mm -hmm. Megan. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I'll, I'll be very brief. Thank you for your presentation. As you can guess, my question is uh, related to the groundwater licensing. Um, agriculture, uh, sorry, where was it here? The Agricultural Water Reserve, what conversations has, has taken place so far with that? And where are you at with that? And will there be anything more coming on that? I'm so glad you brought that up. Um, it is actually written in, so in the Water Act, it is in the Water Act, and that's where it stayed. So unfortunately, discussions to, it was in previous government, so um, unfortunately when it was incorporated into the Water Act, this agricultural water reserve, there weren't discussions that um, talked about how we get it to the next step so we would love to do that and we do have we have had submissions in the past in respects to how we could take the next steps in that regard so um and we we do have a plan in place and we would be happy to have discussions on that wonderful thank you so much well, we'll have to wrap it up, Danielle, but uh, um, <laughs> I do, on behalf of the committee, I want to thank you for your presentation. Uh, I uh, was, thank you for the reminder about the empty shelves. And, you know, in, in that context, um, we went through 18 months where we found that we could actually change each other's behavior. Mm -hmm. And that, uh, so we can uh, perhaps if we all pull together in the same way, change our behavior so that we're making uh, choices uh, that involve uh, local produce. Thank, Thank you. you very much. And our next presenter is Kevin Boone, BC Cattlemen's Association. Uh, Kevin, you have uh, five minutes. Uh, we're keeping uh, track uh, with our phone. Um, we will signal you uh, when you have 30 seconds so that you know to wrap up, and, uh, and then we'll have uh, five minutes to ask you questions. Uh, and yeah, there we go. Thanks. You must know that I get a little long-winded, so uh, those, those reminders help a lot. Um, so I, first of all, want to thank all of you for the opportunity to present for you uh, here today. And uh, BC Cattlemen's Association represents around 1,200 members, uh, cattle ranchers, producers in the province, uh, including our newest uh, addition, and that's a uh, regional on Vancouver Island. Uh, today I'm also going to present on three uh, topics. I'm going to talk on wildfire recovery and preparedness, uh, investment in Crown Range, uh, inf infrastructure and water storage uh, and safety modernization. Um, I'm going to start right off in the wildfire. Um, really uh, what you need to know that's very important in this is in the past five years we've had three major fire events that have consumed uh, over three and a half million hectares of land and have cost uh, the government over 1.7 billion dollars to fight. That's not including the losses that we've accumulated in uh, the resources of timber and forage. Uh, forage being uh, most important to us, of course, because that's the lifeline of our, our industry. Uh, for decades, we feel that the Crown lands have been managed with a focus on producing as many trees as possible with little regard for the forage and other resources that are on there. We feel that in many ways this contributes to the situation that we have out there right now of an overabundance of trees which creates an overabundance of fuel uh, which then creates these wildfires that are extremely hard to manage. Uh, we feel that what needs to be done in this situation is a better job of building a landscape level right on the ground planning method and uh, situation so that we can build on the ground what we need for going forward to not only uh, manage those resources but to manage for the light of fire. Uh, right now uh, we've got a blank uh, easel out there. We've got an, uh, a blank picture and we're holding the paintbrush and what we do in this next one or two years in recovery and rehabilitation 
will set the stage for the next 50 years on that land base. So it's very important. But it's also very important that we do this management on the rest of that landscape too. So this means uh, for this that uh, we have some, some fairly uh, simple requests and that is that we initiate the planning stage and that will mean uh, looking at the stems per hectare that we are doing on there, looking at how much forage is in between and looking at the water resources that are also on that. So we're building a plan for that whole hectare of land and every hectare of land to make the best possible use for timber, for forage, for wildlife. And I think that's extremely important. It's also really important for us to understand that while we plant a lot of trees, uh, especially with carbon sequestration in mind, that grass is a huge supporter and a huge sequester of grass, or of, of carbon, I apologize. Uh, when we look at the stem to root ratio, uh, in grass, ma the majority of the carbon is stored in the, st in the root, uh, whereas in trees, it's in the, in, in the stem. So when we have a fire, the grass burns off very quickly, very little carbon released because most of it is building the soil underneath, whereas trees, most of it goes into the air. Uh, we th feel too that with the use of cattle, we are already doing trials where we're utilizing cattle to graze that fine fuel and actually reduce the amount of uh, ha or, or risk that we have for uh, fire out there. Uh, we would suggest uh, that an investment of $10 million be made over five years' time, uh, utilizing a million dollars a year for two years to do the planning. Uh, equipment and training for, uh, of, of $2 million for two years and implementation for five years. The training and equipment would be for the other phase in here that we're recommending and that would be to train community brigades for first attack and first response on these fires. Many of these fires do not need to become fires if they are actually combated before they get a start. We have the people, we have the resources and we have the ability to do it. Wow, five minutes went quick. Um, I'm gonna go really quickly through the next two and not give you the background so much. We would also like to see an investment in aging infrastructure on the Crown land. Uh, the fences, a lot of the uh, waterworks are uh, getting depleted and need to be upgraded. Uh, as well, we feel that there's opportunity to put land that's in non-use back into use by uh, rebuilding fences and, and containing that so we can better utilize that resource. Our recommendation on that is a four-year uh, investment of, uh, or a five-year investment of $3 million a year for a total of $15 million. The last one, which is probably uh, in many ways the most important, is, as Lauren was talking, and that's water and water storage. Uh, in climate and climate adaptation, we feel that the, most, the only way we can actually uh, do anything is to manage our water. The only way we can manage our water is to store our water. There's many ways of doing that. We know with the, the dams we have right now, uh, we need to update and modernize these and we need an investment in that. But we also need to look at new ways of storing water. We need to le learn from the beaver and make some small uh, dams on tributaries. We can store as much water in ground as above ground uh, and utilize that. It's very important for not only uh, management of agriculture, recreation, but most important to a lot of people is it creates habitat for the fish and for uh, the spawning of these in the tributaries and we can only manage it if we store it and we feel that this is paramount if we're looking forward to uh, climate adaptation. Uh, we feel that in this we would like to see a, uh, for the modernization and investment over three years of $5 million a year for a total of $15 million. Uh, being as I got long-winded on the fire, I will uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to come before you and, and welcome any questions on these or any other topics where you feel that uh, you might have interest. Thank you, Kevin. And I know there's questions, and that will give you an opportunity to uh, add some of the pieces you didn't get a chance to you yet. Bet. Lauren. Thank you for your five-minute presentation, <laughs> Kevin. Um, listen, we talked a little bit, and you, you touched on uh, range, uh, grass, et cetera. We talked to weed folks earlier today in Prince George uh, that would support everything that you said. Um, what I don't understand is you touched on waiting one, or not necessarily waiting, but you mentioned a one to two year time frame. Isn't this work that we should be doing right now? 
It's absolutely. We we suggest it uh, start right now, but uh, the, on the crown land, about 90 to 95 percent of our province is crown land. It's going to take more than one year to do the planning because we feel it needs to be planned throughout, not just what's been burnt, but the entire landscape. And in order to do that, it will take time, uh, and two years probably won't be sufficient. Uh, but we would like to see it started right away with some of the projects being started. And a great place to start is right here at home uh, where the fires have hit and where we have that. Uh, you know what it's like up in Flat Lake. Uh, you know what the fires have done there. Uh, we can still work on the fires from 17 and 18 in those areas without having to go in and select a vlog uh, to do it. We feel that there's opportunity in that. We don't feel that the traditional clear-cut ways are the way to go. We need to select a vlog over time so that we can be constantly harvesting, constantly upgrading, and constantly keeping that forage coming into play. And it also is allowing in that the trapping of the snow and proper uh, melt-off so that our freshet does not all come at once and we can reduce some of that, uh, that flooding capabilities that are out there. So by planning ahead, we can do a whole bunch of things between re resource development, but also getting uh, to the crutch of trying to help to prevent some of these forest fires. Thanks. And I just, not a question, just I appreciated your comments about the first response to uh, forest fires in the, in the province in general terms. Thank you very much, Kevin. Thank you. Uh, Megan. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Hi. Uh, thank you for your presentation. It's great to see you. Uh, the fences that you mentioned that need to be repaired, I remember the last project on that. Um, uh, are you looking sort of like over 50%, 80% and do you think it all needs to be redone at this point again? No, so that's why we, uh, there, there's a lot of things. Fences are constantly uh, coming and going and deteriorating. Uh, if we build fences right, uh, we can get 35 to 40 years out of them. Mm -hmm. If we don't build them right and if we don't maintain them, and I, a part of this plan would be a maintenance program on mm -hmm. them, um, and so in it, it's a phased program. We always have to be updating. Uh, but one of the things especially that we find is we've got a lot of land that is in non-use because we have not made the investment back into this infrastructure and these fences. Uh, we feel that uh, in situations such as this year where we've lost a lot of that grassland to fires, uh, if we had some of those vacancies uh, fenced, we, could, we would have a place to move cattle. We also feel that by fencing them, even if we don't have a fire, I hope we can get ahead of these fires where we don't have that situation. But by putting them back into use, we create opportunities for new entrants to come in and utilize this uh, grass as tenures because what we're using now is full. We need to expand. We need to have that ability for sustainability, and that will give us that opportunity as well. Okay, that makes sense. And just a quick follow-up, um, Madam Chair. It, with the water management idea you have for storage, do you have a... A written plan you might be submitting? Um, we've got a basis of a plan. We've ed I, it's interesting as I started to put this, I'm beginning to feel like a broken record and I'm really happy to see new members on this standing committee every time because I've presented the same thing seven years in a row of investment into the infrastructure for storage. Um, I get very uh, warm response to it, but we get very little action. And uh, we've spent a lot of time uh, talking about and, and the questions on the Water Groundwater Act and the, the Surface Act and the Water Sustainability mm -hmm. Act. We've consumed a lot of time in the last five, six years just trying to get uh, a license for our wells, uh, which is dismally slow due to the process. Uh, we've got less than a quarter of them done. We need to really concentrate on that surface water. And, you know, many of you might be aware of, of Stump Lake out here and the flooding issues we've had. There's a really good example of where we could learn a lesson from the beavers. I don't want to re-import the beavers because they're destructive. But taking two or three of the tributaries coming into there and building a series of small dams, the water you see on top is minor compared to the water the ground stores, and that's self-irrigation of that grassland. So we're creating riparian areas. We're uh, creating better opportunities for uh, that. So these plans are um, part and parcel where you have to build them according to what is in front of you and where you need to build it. All right. Thank you very much. You're welcome. 
Okay. Uh, well, we're actually out of time. Uh, so on behalf of the committee, uh, Kevin, I want to uh, thank you for your presentation. And I guess on a personal note, what I'd like to say is um, you have reinforced and demonstrated the importance of local community expertise when it comes to addressing uh, the big social issues that affect us all. So thank you. I learned lots. Well, thank you. And I, I guess it goes to say that some of us guys that are getting long in the tooth and older, we do still have a use, and that's the history we bring with us. So I thank you for that. Absolutely. Thank you. And our next presenter is Glenn Lucas, BC Fruit Growers Association. So, Glenn, I think you know the drill. Five minutes. We'll give you a signal when uh, you have 30 seconds to wrap up, and then we'll ask questions. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, well, thank you. It's a pleasure being here uh, again to see the committee, and uh, good to see some, some familiar faces. Uh, we represent the BC Fruit Growers Association, represents 350 commercial tree fruit producers in the Okanagan, Similkameen, and Creston Valleys. And we're starting to move north, so we're even seeing things around uh, uh, salmon arm and, and cantaloupes, uh, some new plantings. Our vision for the tree fruit industry is a prosperous, sustainable, innovative tree fruit sector in BC that grows products that improve health. And I think we've achieved uh, a good measure of sustainability. We have a sterile insect release program that reduces pesticides. Um, we, we're innovative, we have uh, high density plantings, very efficient irrigation. We haven't achieved the prosperity that we need to. Um, and certainly there's been current challenges, uh, as, and as the legislators are uh, uh, aware of, COVID-19 pandemic, um, the climate emergency, and uh, Remember that before all of that, we had the opioid addiction uh, emergency as well. So I'll focus on COVID-19 and climate emergency impacts. But going into those two, we had a tough financial situation in our sector. We had a trade war between the U.S. and China. And uh, over a two-year period, uh, Washington State producers, and they're right next door, received what uh, would have been the equivalent of us in BC, our tree fruit sector, receiving $20.8 million. And uh, I can tell you that the Ministry of Agriculture has told us that our sector has received $30 million over the last 20 or 25 years through various programs like production insurance and so on. So $20 million over two years. It was a flood of money south and it hurt us. Uh, retail food consolidation, some good news on that. Uh, we have a, a federal initiative to establish a national food retailer code of conduct. And, you know, those rules will go both ways. Sellers will have to, to measure up as well. Um, a third thing that's impacted us before getting to the COVID-19 and, and the climate emergency is the provincial ag budget. And... Uh, in short, uh, the province of Ontario uh, receives about twice as much agriculture funding per dollar of agriculture GDP uh, from the province as what we do in BC, and in Quebec it's three times. And those are the next two biggest apple producing provinces. They have achieved a measure of prosperity, they are growing and successful apple sectors. Um, now, on, on to COVID-19 impacts. Labour is the big thing. Uh, we want to thank uh, the province uh, for the centralised two-week uh, quarantine uh, that the province has provided during uh, COVID-19. That's been huge. We do need to work on modernising our labour uh, initiative or labour availability, and we've, we're developing an action plan for that. The climate emergency, uh, I did an uh, estimate of the loss for this season, uh, which would be $17.3 million out of $103 million potential industry revenue, so about 20%. And uh, we fortunately have agriculture insurance programs. We're thankful for those. They will cover about a third of the loss. So, uh, you know, that's we we're, we're have a weakened financial system coming into it, and... Uh, now we're, we're ha 
that climate uh, emergency has caused us more more uh, problems. So um, I'd like to go to my conclusion and, and basically go to some recommendations. Uh, first, uh, we need some uh, urgent uh, signal from the province that uh, our sector is important and that apple production is important. And we'd like to see uh, provincial uh, uh, investment into the SIR program, thank you, of 11.2 million over the next five years. Uh, SIR is, is uh, because we've had a 15% reduction in apple acreage, it's really under pressure. Uh, a, a general uh, increase in ag budget uh, would be helpful. Uh, and, uh, you know, the provincial treasury is under pressure, so maybe we could dip into those Columbia River Treaty funds that are being renegotiated right now. Uh, we'd like to uh, manage our own marketing a little more closely, and that it would be to establish a marketing commission or, or a marketing board for apples. Uh, Kevin and, and Danielle mentioned water. Securing the water supply is very important, especially under climate change. And uh, we support the Ag Water Reserve, and the infrastructure uh, storage improvement is huge. Uh, we had problems in uh, where I live in Lake Country about 10 years ago and in Summerland about 10 years ago as well. And they just built the dams higher and it solved all the problems. So we just need that investment. And lastly, um, we'd like to see some improvements to the agriculture property tax system that would actually incentivize agriculture use. Uh, the, the deferral of the um, qualification for two years is a mistake. That encourages non-agriculture use. We need to encourage agriculture use. That means increasing the taxation on non-agriculture use of ALR land and perhaps diverting that into the ag budget or into a, a trust that would, would fund uh, ag programs. Uh, and with that, together we can achieve uh, you know, the third part of our vision, which is that prosperity for agriculture producers and ensure food security for BC. Thank you. Thank you, Glenn. I'll ask uh, members of the committee uh, for their questions. Ben. Thanks very much. Good to see you here. This is a long way from home. We're, we're headed there tomorrow. <laughs> Anyways. I'm, I wanted to I, be with my friends. <laughs> yeah, well, that's good. Hey, um, just in terms of the tax exemption, could you uh, explain that? So, uh, like... You're saying that there's an exemption for two years right now if you take agricultural land out of production, like let's say you're replanting, and there's an exemption currently by BC assessment or... Uh, no, there was a... Uh, so in order to qualify for the property tax, the lower property tax for agriculture, yeah. Class 9, yeah. uh, you need to have uh, $3,500 worth of sales, right. essentially, or 10000 if it's below 2 oh. hectares. Yeah. And um, that's too low. All of agriculture agrees that that's too low. We need to intensify the use of that land and, uh, and make it into uh, less available for those uh, country estates and more productive for agriculture. So to be more succinct, you're saying that the $2,500 is not, I don't think it's 3500 I think it's 2500 between two acres to 10 or whatever yep. it is, yep. right? That number is too low. needs yes. to go up. Yes. Okay. The Thank minimum you. level for our, our t membership in our association is fifteen thousand dollars revenue, and, and that's probably too low. Yeah. Okay. Carwinder. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you, Glenn. Nice to see you in person, and thank great uh, presentation. Uh, under your ask, you mentioned uh, one of the things that manage own marketing. Uh, can you please elaborate how would that be different and what are the challenges that we have if it, within the existing marketing strategy? Yeah. Uh, so we have many um, packing houses. We have one large co-op that, that packs about 50% of the apples and about 20% of the cherries. And then a, lot, a number of other packing houses. Some of them are big, but many small ones. And they compete with each other and they they get beat up by the consolidated retailers, is essentially it. So we'd like to have a marketing commission that would gather all of the information and make it available back to the, the, the uh, marketing uh, agents so that then they would have good information 
competition is based on perfect information and we have this built in uh, it's uh, like molasses the information flowing from one packer to another and there's some competitive issues there too or competition issues so by having a marketing commission we could share that uh, there's been some talk about um, uh, setting price targets um, and uh, quality uh, standards as well uh, to protect markets so that uh, we aren't undercutting ourselves by by undermining the quality. So those are some of the ideas for a marketing commission. A really quick follow-up, Chair. Um, so I know I still have your presentation uh, that when we virtually met, would you be submitting the written uh, pre presentation to the committee? Because I really like how you had the graph in comparison between Ontario, Quebec, and BC, where we are. Yes. That was really an eye-opener for me. So I wonder if you'll be presenting written submission to us as a committee. Absolutely. I will be, uh, and I'm uh, going to be doing that tonight. Thank you. Appreciate it. Uh, group, and that's probably all we'll have time for, probably. <coughs> Thank you, Glenn. Very quickly, uh, one, I would like to know, um, do you have sufficient uh, labor available under the current circumstances? And the second one is, uh, quickly, if you can explain a little bit more about the SIR program, like uh, what it the, what is the program and you're recommending kind of extending it or making it better? So if you can speak about that. Uh, so briefly, labor, we don't have enough. Um, for the larger growers, they tend to um, uh, focus on the, the seasonal ag worker program, Mexico and Caribbean workers. And this year, we're probably about 80 or 90 percent arrivals on that. Uh, which is good compared to the, the smaller farms that rely on domestic workers uh, and backpackers from Quebec, for example. And that's really dried up, in, in, and so we're very short of labour. I, I had a couple of interviews with the press today on that. So we're trying to encourage local workers to come out, but, you know, you go to the restaurant and you see the signs on the windows, they're short of workers too, everyone's short. Uh, so there's some, some things we can do to solve that. The... Um, Sterile Insect Release Program. It's uh, a partnership between the three regional districts and producers. It's unique in the world. Uh, so local governments and producers have partnered. They raise uh, property taxes and it runs a factory in a Soyuz that rears hundreds of millions of, of this pest. It's a coddling moth. It's a worm in the apple. We raise them, we sterilize them with gamma radiation and release them into the orchards and they're sterile and they, it interferes with wild moths breeding. So any of the offspring are, well they're just infertile. So um, that's been a very successful program. It's been economic, it's been environmental um, and um, because of our 15% uh, acreage reduction in apples in the last three years, you know, they're we need to restructure that and figure out a new way of, of operating with uh, and um, doing different things, uh, maybe adding more pests, more uh, maybe adding cherries into that. But that takes time and we need a bridge for that. Thank you. Well, Glenn, we're out of time, yep. um, but I'd, I'd really like to thank you on behalf of the committee uh, for your presentation. Um, I wrote down um, that your goal, your mission is to uh, produce products that improve health. And I can tell you as a uh, urban consumer, um, I know that BC fruit is preferred. Um, but we can't always get it. Yes. And I, <laughs> and I think you're telling us why that is. <laughs> yes. Thank you. And uh, just promote Agriculture Day that BC Ag Council is uh, coming up here. And we're hoping to have apples in your gift basket for that day. Oh. Great. Uh, so okay. looking forward to that. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Yeah. Thank you. So our uh, next presenter is uh, Carmen Massey, Shushwap Trail Alliance. Thank you. Shifting gears from agriculture a little bit. This is my first time to present to you, so thank you very much for this opportunity. I'm the president of the Shoe Swap Trail Alliance, and um, I'm here to represent 
um, the, the issues and concerns and needs of, of our specific watershed, but also in general the, the provincial needs of recreation access management support. <clears throat> so just to give you a little bit of background, and thank you, Greg, Greg and Kylo, he knows quite a bit about this. We've talked about this at great length. Um, but the Shoe Swap Trail Alliance is an organizational body that was formed in 2005 that is truly an alliance of partners throughout our region. So we, are, uh, we work together to develop uh, trail strategies um, from as First Nations, so all forest equipment communities in our uh, watershed, uh, stewardship groups, government uh, agencies, many from the provincial government, uh, industry, um, businesses, and community stewardship organizations, and many individuals. So we all work together through this alliance to try to, um, or the purpose, and, and I think we've been very successful in this, um, to develop, operate, maintain, and promote a network of non-motorized trails, waterways, and hut-to-hut -hut routes throughout the Shuswap watershed region. So we are, one of our main strategies to, to be effective in this work is to create a round table. So the round table it meets annually on a larger basis and then there's quarterly working groups and that round table is comprised of our partner um, organizations, communities, groups and we uh, address as, as, as a collaborative group these issues that come up. It's been a really effective model and um, one that uh, others throughout the province have been trying to follow and, and hopefully are also finding success. Um, so we also would like to acknowledge that the province has been an excellent partner in that roundtable process. We've worked closely with rec sites and trails BC, BC Parks, and uh, many of the uh, forestry um, management agencies and individuals. Um, they, you, you've definitely been a big part of that roundtable process. Also, the Rural Dividend Fund has been essential in this um, trail development process. And an important thing to realize for you when you're thinking about funding is this Rural Dividend Fund, it works for us in the rural communities. It's, it allows us to have multi-year projects, phased project approaches. It's flexible, it's proven to be very effective. We've been able to get work done and we've also been able to create economic benefit for the shoe swap region. So thank you for that funding and, and we do want to let you know that it's been important to us. Um, but there are many areas of recreation um, planning and management funding that, that need to be increased. Um, uh, I think we all understand and agree, and especially after a summer like we've had with the heat and the smoke that, uh, and the climate change crisis, that, that a, the, probably the greatest asset that BC has is our natural environment and um, our parks and our, our trails and our green spaces and our lakes and our rivers and our coastlines and, and they're essential, all of them, to a future of a robust economy in this province. But the pan and the pandemic has shown us how much we value these assets. It really has. We, it, the people have gone out in the landscape in numbers unseen before, which is a wonderful thing but also a very big challenge. Our trails, infrastructures, our, 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 our amenities, our people who guard the safety and well-being of our, of our uh, wildlife and our species at risk are challenged and underfunded. And so due to that lack of funding and staff shortages, especially at Rec Sites Trails BC, um, the Shoe Swap Trail Alliance and, and many of our regional partners have had to um, contribute, thank you for the 30 second warning, um, have had to contribute a lot of volunteer and in-kind um, capacity to make these things happen. So we're missing opportunities, we're not managing the landscape as well as we should, and we recommend that with an increased fund funding to rec sites and trails BC to $20 million, you would be able to create capacity for those hardworking employees who, that you have on the ground out there that we work with every day. BC parks, rec sites, trails, those people are amazing and you have an amazing staff. Um, we would also like to encourage you to designate some funds for localized collaborative land management. 
And even five or six thousand dollars for a little group like the Shoe Swap Trail Alliance is a game changer. It allows us to leverage people, volunteers, individuals who 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 otherwise just don't quite have the capacity. And we also would like you to encourage you to allocate additional funds for the ongoing development and maintenance of trails through programs such as the Rural Dividend Fund. So thank you. Thank you for your attention. Thank you for listening. This is the first time we've been able to address your committees, so really appreciate it. Thank you, Carmen. And uh, now we'll uh, invite questions. Greg. Well, good to see you, Carmen. And uh, I can certainly attest to the great work of the Shushwap uh, Trail Alliance. Uh, it is an amazing organization that is really, as Carmen laid out, uh, pulled everybody together. So everybody from BC Parks, Flinro, uh, Parks and Rec, and First Nations and community groups. So uh, certainly want to uh, compliment uh, Carmen and, and uh, Shushwap Trail Alliance for the amazing work they do in the Shushwap. Uh, we were very successful a number of years ago with a, a provincial contribution for the uh, Okanagan uh, Shoe Swap Rail Trail, so a rail trail network that starts in Sycamus and will eventually connect with the Okanagan Rail Trail. And that was an investment about $2.17 million from the province, which was the single largest contributor towards uh, the $6.6 .6 million purchase price for that rail bed. And I know there's a lot of work that's being undertaken now to now doing the surfacing work and all of the infrastructure required with it. But, um, you know, that although that is a large project, it'll obviously bring a lot of... Uh, folks to the Shushwap area, uh, many of the other trail networks have seen just a significant increase. I think some of the numbers we were talking about earlier, like a 40% increase in actual utilization of many of these trails in the area. And the Rural Dividend Fund was a program that was very successful in supporting some of these small organizations around the province. And, uh, and that, uh, I think, is what Carmen has asked for, is maybe having to that one uh, reinstituted because it was a, a very successful program, uh, especially for rural parts of the province. So, Carmen, thank you very much for coming in today. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Lauren. Thanks, Carmen. Thanks for presenting. Uh, I, I noted the Rural Dividend Fund as well. I just wondered if you could uh, give us a bit of a sense of how much funding you've actually received over the last little while. And I know that you talked in terms of $20 million, but I think you're speaking to a bigger exactly. uh, provincial mm -hmm. effort there. And uh, what, what, uh, what kind of funding would you be specifically looking for for your projects? <laughs> well, actually, I didn't come here today specifically to advocate for funding for specific projects necessarily for the Shoe Swap Trail Alliance because I feel like this is a provincial issue that needs to be looked at on a larger scale. Of course, if, if you set up some sort of funding model that would support trail development provincially, and I think the um, rec, uh, trail, recreation, Outdoor Recreation Council and BC Trails have put forth submissions to you as well. We totally are in line with their advocacy as well and believe uh, what they have to say is, is, is right in the right direction. So if those things were implemented provincially, we would be able to access that funding. But the Rural Dividend Fund over the past three years, I believe we have accessed through the Trail Alliance as a partner in funding um, about 300,000. And it has funded, uh, it, Greg referred to the rail trail, um, the initial study the feasibility study and the planning, that's a very difficult thing to get funding for planning. There's lots of infrastructure planning, not a lot of, uh, lots of in infrastructure funding, but not a lot of planning funding. And that Rural Dividend Fund allows us to do that. And, and trails are a funny thing. Like you'd never think of building a highway network without planning it properly and without funding it well in advance. But trails, which are so important to our communities now and our, live, and our livelihoods, many people's livelihoods and our economy, our tourism economy, and, and just people walking their dog, their quality of life, it's so important, especially COVID shown us. And we wouldn't leave that up to just little small volunteer groups. We would, we would support them in a real strategic way. And uh, so the rec sites and trails is doing as well as they can to manage all this on a landscape level, but it's, it's challenging for them. And if they have better funding, and if we have better funding, um, we'll all be able to be more effective in making a better trail network for everyone. Thank you very much. Appreciate your passion and your advocacy. <laughs> Thank you. 
And uh, with that, um, we'll wrap up uh, this uh, part of the afternoon. And on behalf of the committee, Carmen, I'd like to thank you. And um, I'd like to thank you for um, uh, taking the time to uh, uh, describe to us what is working now so that we build on that. Uh, so that we, um, in our deliberations and our recommendations, we don't think we need to make recommendations that start from scratch, mm -hmm. but that um, you've reinforced the things that work and that what needs to be done to make it even better. So thank you so much. Thank you. So our next presenter is um, Andrea Barnett, who's making two presentations. So we'll make a we'll make a we'll make a distinction. Uh, so you can start with your presentation on behalf of uh, Ducks Unlimited yes. Canada. Yes, and I would like to begin by thanking the committee for your generosity with me in terms of your time. Um, I wear several hats, including working for Ducks Unlimited, being a rancher. Uh, I'm a sessional instructor at Thompson Rivers University. Um, I uh, do some work in, in collaboration with the BC Cattlemen's Association. I also coordinate the Target One Funders Collaborative, which looks to bring philanthropic match um, to uh, projects that uh, are in support of conservation. But I want to begin by um, talking about um, uh, what Ducks Unlimited Canada's suggestions would be uh, for the committee to consider in terms of budgetary um, investments. And I really would echo a lot of what, um, what we've heard previously. Um, Ducks Unlimited would strongly encourage this committee to look at keeping water on the landscape as being a central core piece of whether we want to look at in terms of reaching broader policy objectives or build back better, this idea of investing in water infrastructure um, helps achieve so many broader uh, objectives, whether we're talking about wildfire management, whether we're talking about in support of nature-based climate change solutions, in support of industry like agriculture, wildlife more broadly, recreation, human health, public safety. It is a, such a high value uh, investment. And so I want to encourage, I want to sort of break apart the discussion of um, keeping water on the landscape into three pieces. And the first is really very much echoing what many of my colleagues and friends here have said today, which is this idea of encouraging government to recommit and invest in existing water infrastructure on the landscape. So just to give you an idea, um, Ducks Unlimited Canada, we um, either own or cooperatively manage over 600 um, dams um, in British Columbia. And many of these dams are uh, reaching a point where we need to conduct life cycle um, maintenance. Recent regulatory changes have switched the parameters and have made these sorts of uh, maintaining these sorts of structures much more expensive, uh, and have changed the liability profile of being a dam owner. Um, so, um, what we would really uh, what we would really like to um, encourage government to look at those existing water pieces of water infrastructure that are on the landscape. They do risk being decommissioned or naturalized if there are not new investments. And whether you're talking about an agricultural landowner or whether you're talking about an NGO like Ducks Unlimited Canada, in the absence of new investments, we will lose the infrastructure that we have. Um, so that being the first part. The second part would be that we think that we should have more water on the landscape. That should be the ultimate aim. Um, and so we would encourage government to look at opportunities to enhance the amount of water that we store, enhance the health of riparian areas, look at existing reservoirs, see if we can um, add uh, capacity. And we would encourage you to look at um, you know, particularly now that we know the outcome of the federal election and we've seen um, the budget uh, that was uh, tabled federally uh, recently and the massive investment in nature, there is so much opportunity to leverage federal funding to this aim. And I know that BC is in the process of negotiating a Canada-BC nature agreement. There is tremendous 
there's generational opportunity um, to leverage um, that sort of funding um, to make a real difference. Um, and also um, looking at partners on the landscape like Ducks Unlimited Canada and agricultural producers that would stand beside that. Um, and then the third piece of keeping water in the landscape um, would be to prioritize um, uh, uh, having staff looking at different opportunities for this within the ministries, adding more capacity. There's not enough capacity to do the sort of thinking on government end. Uh, so that would be encouraged, additional, um, additional staff resources, as well as when you have um, sort of looking at the regulatory and permitting environment where water is concerned, um, it has become increasingly onerous um, and the liabilities have really increased such that it really is a, a, an, in, a, it's a, an impediment um, to doing this sort of conservation work. So while not a budgetary recommendation, looking at regulatory um, alignment and simplification for these sorts of projects like keeping water on the landscape that we can all agree are a good idea, let's work together to make conservation and water storage something that is easy to do. So with that, um, I would like to thank you and uh, uh, take any questions. Thank you, Andrea. Yeah. Uh, questions? Sorry. Yeah. Greg. Thank you. Uh, with the 600 different uh, dams that you had referenced, yeah. um, what is the typical lifespan? Have you guys uh, done an inventory to determine what the actual cost will be of bringing those up to yeah. the new uh, standards? What we know is we know um, that within the next decade, we uh, need to conduct life cycle maintenance on at least a third of those. So at least 200 projects, and the projects vary tremendously in size. Um, so we sort of, uh, you know, the costing of it on an annual basis, um, the actual number is hard to predict, but we're talking about, you know, several million dollars a year are required to do the infrastructure um, upgrades that are needed. And I will just, I'll just re sort of remind the committee that many of these infrastructures were put in place 30 years ago with different um, construction methods and different construction materials. Um, a lot of those would be different now and might have a longer lifespan. It also came in when there was that initial infusion of American dollars um, through the North American Waterfowl Conservation Act, NACA, which is match funding. Um, so, and that really in the late 80s and early 90s, we saw a huge infusion of that, um, uh, that match funding to put a lot of these projects in place together. And now they are reaching their sort of life cycle um, maintenance, um, sort of uh, their generational kind of maintenance that's required. Sure, and there currently is not a bucket of funding that's targeted towards no. assisting with that. And no, so there's <clears throat> not. And in many cases, there are partnerships between the province, agriculture producers. Like, it's not just Ducks Unlimited that's doing these. There's management agreements, and, and in some, in some uh, cases, um, there was initial funding put in place from various parties. If I may, uh, Madam Chair, Ooh. it sounds to me that uh, you're pretty close alignment uh, to the presentation by uh, by Kevin Boone with respect yeah, to it's you. not just the surface water, it's the retention and, and increase of, uh, of water retention, I guess, within the groundwater as well. Yeah, absolutely. And it would, it would seem to me that, uh, that the initiatives of Ducks Unlimited and even the agriculture sector is just good for the environment overall. And if it's good for the general uh, society and public, uh, maybe the public purse should uh, be at the table and actually providing considerable funding towards it because uh, I don't know that anybody here would disagree with the merits of, uh, of water retention, especially Absolutely. as we're dealing with climate change. So thank Absolutely. you very when much. When you look at the stream of benefits that's, that is generated broadly in society, um, so you know, for example, uh, the Tunquil Lake and Leighton Lake, which are very famous recreational lakes, um, those are projects where Ducks Unlimited um, was involved, and, and actually were the were the dam owners licensees um, for those for those dams as the as the local area ranchers. So, but think about the benefits more broadly to society, right? So it, it does seem appropriate, uh, an appropriate use of public funds to make sure that the, these sorts of uh, assets, green infrastructure, are allowed to persist. Ben, and we have about two minutes, a little less than two minutes. Okay. Left. 
Thanks, Andrea. Just uh, uh, appreciate the fact that these dams do need to be well monitored and licensed properly and maintained, etc. Now, back when Testalinda Creek uh, yes. collapsed in 2009-2010, right. I guess the question really is, is, um, is that information available to the fingertips of the people that are the regulators? And what's the budget that we're talking about here? Like, put the order of magnitude on, you know, the... In terms of all the dams? Well, order of magnitude in the budget cycle that we're talking about is three years. So, I mean, realistically, uh, we're not talking 10 years, but what's, what is it that you're... What do you, well, what's your organization suggest? What I think, what I think that there needs to be is, I think that we need to look at all of the major dam owners, including things like ranchers, and and bring to get, uh, come together and establish. I wouldn't. I would be hesitant to put forward a number just on behalf of the Engo community. So for us, looking, I, I would probably, for Ducks Unlimited, I would say, you know, $3 million annually for what we manage. But that's not all, that's not all the dams, that's not all the problem. So I think that coming up with some sort of a cost estimate more broadly, um, but certainly, you know, as a starting point, uh, if, we were, if we were looking at, you know, just supporting Engos, um, you know, a, a, a few million dollars annually would be a, a starting point. And I and I would just I would just underscore the fact that the cost associated with these dam upgrades has gone up. We have amended legislation relative to dams for good reason for public safety because of things like Testa Linden, because of things like Mount Polly. But now what we are asking dam owners to do is re-engineer and rebuild at a much higher standard. So that's one of the issues when we when it comes to predicting cost. It's a moving target because things have really changed in terms of the parameters. Thank you. Okay. Thanks for uh, your questions. Um, one more question and then I'm just thinking about yeah. the, uh, uh, we're, we're a bit over time and then you have another presentation. I do, yes. So we could... Thank you, Madam Chair, for your patience. Uh, the question is, you mentioned 600 dams. I think people would be shocked, actually, to yeah. find out how many dams there are out there. You mentioned a third of them need to be replaced um, or at least maintained. I know that we have decommissioned uh, one because of high freshet and because mm -hmm. we were worried it might let go on its own. The irony of that is that that creek is now almost dry at mm -hmm. this point this year. So all of that water that could have been stored mm -hmm. uh, is no longer stored. That's right. My question is um, how many of that third might be at crisis mode? In terms of needing to be yeah. done now. Well, there, <laughs> there's there's a lot that need to be there's a lot that need to be done now, um, uh, and I would have to look to our engineers to really decisively answer that question. Um, but in terms of managing our workload as an ENGO, I mean, our our aim would be to do th two or three, three or four projects annually as something that's manageable with our staff complement. But if there was an infusion of funding, um, which could also in turn and translate into capacity, not just materials. Um, you know, th there are many that, that really need to be re-engineered, even if it's just about meeting, uh, upgrading to meet uh, safety standards. Thank you. Okay. Okay, so we do have a time, uh, a bit of a time yes. pressure, so why don't you just go right into I'll your I'll go right into, step. yes. So, I, so I, now I want to present on, um, as a rancher. So I, um, our family ranch, which is a fifth generation family ranch, was, was really impacted by the Tremont Creek fire. So we lost all of our range and we lost a bunch of cattle. Um, and so we're really, um, I feel like we have a very up close and personal kind of view around wildfire management. So what I want to bring um, is just a few sort of recommendations as an individual rancher um, that I think should really be um, considered. And I would like to start by just expressing gratitude to the province and also to the federal government for the extent to which um, you've come to the bar with disaster management. I cannot tell you how important that is because we would be having Remax out to our ranch were it not for that. So thank you as a starting point. Um, I would like to talk about sort of three different uh, nodes, one being wildfire and disaster prevention. What I just said on behalf of Ducks Unlimited in terms of keeping water in the landscape would be one of the things that I would say needs to be um, considered as part of wildfire prevention. Um, also management as well. Um, I would also recommend that um, 
pri there's a prioritization on fuel management, wherein we develop um, a robust prescribed burn regime. Ranchers are asking for this. Indigenous communities, our neighbor community, Skeechiston, who we have a fabulous relationship with, has been you know, trying to lead the way on this for years. This should be institutionalized as an, as an effective means of fire management because, as we know, um, the problem is only going to get worse. Um, I would echo what Kevin said about this need to take sort of a planning and broader policy view in terms of um, both how we do prevention and also how we do recovery. The second kind of note is sort of immediately dealing with the wildfire crisis management. Um, I would echo the comments of many people um, that we heard this summer of there was not enough funding allocated to wildfire management. We need to, I was pleased to hear Premier Horgan talk about the idea of going to a 12 month um, kind of management regime. Um, I think that that makes a lot of sense as does having more funding. But in addition to more funding, it needs to be allocated differently. And again, to echo a little bit of what um, uh, my colleague Kevin has said, um, it's this idea of engaging local communities, be they, be they loggers, be they ranchers, or be they indigenous communities, particularly on initial attack. And that needs to be instituted before there are fires. There were three fires on our ranch, and there's a sense that a bunch of those fires, had we had access, early on and, an, and sort of an, a, a, an initial attack strategy that leveraged our community resources, we could have actioned those fires much more effectively. It would have been much more, um, much less expensive. So let's create that system. Um, and, uh, and so uh, we also, I would also say that um, we would say that, um, you know, there's Indigenous communities who have been uh, talking about taking this on as part of Guardians programs. Um, and I, uh, you know, you hear the Simp First Nation and Skeechiston. Um, I think that they are really leading the way and are extremely well positioned um, to take a, a leadership role um, in, in collaboration with the ranchers and the loggers um, to do this. And I would recommend when looking at, again, looking at the federal uh, a budgetary envelope, almost $400 million has been um, allocated federally to Indigenous-led um, conservation, including Guardians programs. That's leverage money that's on the table that could be used to help with wildfire management. Um, and then in terms of the, the third piece would be disaster recovery. Um, and I would just echo this idea that we need to plan um, carefully around how we do the recovery, how we do reseeding, how we manage the forest resource, um, and there should be investments made, um, made in that because that will sort of dictate the future playing field and the future of um, wildfire management and, and ec the economics on the landscape. So with that, um, I thank you again um, for allowing me to present in two capacities, and I would take any questions on that matter. Okay, great. Um, so here's another opportunity for uh, members of the committee to ask questions, perhaps questions you didn't get a chance to ask before. <laughs> or different questions. <laughs> <laughs> Lauren, and then sure, Ben. <laughs> uh, not, not so much a question, I, I guess, but uh, I, I thank you for your presentation because I just think that uh, I have seen with my own eyes, I refer, referenced it this morning, uh, with the weed folks talking about Pressy Lake, which was left mm. to its own uh, demise, to be honest. And now, of course, it is just noxious weeds for as far as That's the eye right. can see. So um, I, I will do everything I can to support your initiative. So thanks for presenting. Awesome. Thank you. Ben. Um, thanks again, um, Andrea. Just the um, disaster financial assistance you said that was a life, uh, mm -hmm. life saving. Yeah. Can you just... Uh, quickly tell me what it is that you received or how it was based uh, well there's a bunch of different there's a bunch of different programs so there was through EMBC there's sort of the emergency management programs that covered um, some things like short-term immediate needs for feed we had to evacuate 
over 600 animals. Um, and those are just the ones we evacuated. So there was a feed program um, and a transportation subsidy um, that was allocated uh, towards that, sort of the short-term funding. And then there's also um, now this, um, this it, it's mostly federal funding, but I think that there's also some provincial match associated um, with this through agri-recovery that looks at the next um, sort of 12 to 18 months and the fact that we have no grass, we have no infrastructure, and we have to um, continue to support um, to support our ranch and find places for our cattle. So things like paying for feed in the interim, paying for the transportation of livestock, paying for some of the infrastructure um, that has been um, that has been devastated. Um, there's a whole bunch of different pieces to it, and it's all invaluable. Pay paying for cattle mortality um, would be another one. The lost cattle that we lost in the fire, we lost over. Um, I, I think the latest count is about 70 animals. So these, these are animals that will either not rebreed or not go to market. And as, as people know, the, the margins are razor thin in agriculture, right? So, you know, every little bit has an impact and we would not be able to withstand in the absence of those programs. So again, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Any other questions? I think we have time for one or two. Share group. And thank you very much. Uh, I would like to ask maybe a question about the first presentation. Yeah, for sure. You know, as my colleague said, he has 600 uh, mm -hmm. dams. There's quite a number. That's a lot. So what percentage of these dams are publicly owned and privately owned? That's a good question. I need to have my I need to have my um, my spreadsheet. In some cases, they're actually owned by the province, but Ducks Unlimited is the agent of the dam. Okay. So, and in some cases, it is a partnership between agriculture, uh, like an agriculture producer, and Ducks Unlimited. And so, in in each case, there's there can be um, sort of a different um, a different kind of a structure in terms of how that agreement works. But in one way or another, either as the owner or the agent, Ducks Unlimited Canada is responsible for 600 um, of, of, the, of the dams. And so I think that by um, number of licenses, Ducks Unlimited is, is the largest water license holder uh, provincially. By volume, you know, BC Hydro has us beat. But by number of structures, it's, it, we're the largest um, licensee. Yeah. Okay. okay, well, with that, I want to thank you on behalf yeah. of the committee, Andrea, and uh, there, um, the coordination of the, uh, of the presentations uh, and the way you've built on uh, each other's presentations has been really uh, impressive, and the way you've uh, built out uh, what our previous speakers have said. So you've given us a lot to work with. Thank Good. you. Awesome, and I will, I've, I've submitted the Ducks Unlimited one already, and I'll submit some notes on the my okay. personal as a rancher one. So thanks again Great. for the opportunity. Okay, thank you. And uh, our next presenter is uh, Colin O'Leary, Kamloops Chamber of Commerce. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. Uh, so yes, I'm speaking on behalf of the Chamber of Commerce as the Vice Chair of the Policy and Advocacy Committee. And uh, the Chamber of Commerce represents an interest of over 600 local and regional businesses within the Thompson-Nicola Regional District, and we've worked on bringing forward policy recommendations to support the needs of our business community, provincially and federally. Um, I should also mention that I am one of the founders and currently the president of a nonprofit society uh, called STAPS, and we actually operate now three clinics within the region and uh, Actually, service 15% of the population as a nonprofit, completely independently. Actually, so speak from operational understanding as well on this front. But today, we want to focus on the discussion, uh, focus the discussion on the state of healthcare within in the Interior Health region. And our big push in this policy, the idea is that Canada needs to expand the number of players who can collect MSP payment in primary healthcare. Primary healthcare is of the up utmost importance for most people in this province. There is a massive family doctor shortage, and we're seeing impacts across the board and a number of different fronts, including uh, for business owners. And so what we look to do with this policy is actually take something that uh, I worked on actually with Terry Lake when he was Minister of Health five years ago, and we are actually implementing right now, and put it for his recommendation as a solution that can happen immediately to help increase people's ability to access primary health care, which has a direct implication on budget, which I'll get to in a few moments. 
Uh, and the other thing is that this is a decade old, decades-old model. Other provinces in Canada actually are allowing for team-based care. And if you look at the rest of the world, team-based care results in higher quality outcomes and cheaper delivery of health care. So we really need to get into the 21st century on this front. And why is the Kamloops uh, Chamber of Commerce concerned about this model? Because the ability to access primary health care and a family doctor is impacting the availability of labor supply, people making decisions whether to start their businesses and communities or not. Do you know there's a, at one point there's a 30,000 patient wait list for a family doctor in Kamloops uh, out of 120,000 people catchment area? So this is a huge problem. People cannot, some people have been waiting for 10 years for family doctor. So the underlying problem with primary health care and getting access to primary health care is complex. It's not a, necessarily directly a doctor shortage. We're actually getting more doctors through the... Uh, through medical school than we ever have before, but we're losing them for various reasons. So I'm not going to get into those complexities. But what I can say is that the payment structure in the MSP system is something we can tweak and we can have immediate results for access to care for people to be able to access a family doctor's office. So currently doctors are the only healthcare providers that can actually access MSP payment in primary health care. So doctors are actually private businesses that are set up as corporations or sole proprietorships and they have one uh, client that pays them, that's the province, and this is the fee-for-service system. But they're the only ones that can actually collect that payment. So what this policy looks to do is it looks to expand that model and say, why are we not allowing nurses, RNs, and MPs to access the MSP system so that when they operate in their own scope of practice in a family doctor's office, they can get paid for it? We actually did a study where we got very good data and this has happened before, and some doctors actually privately hire nurses to come into their office to help them, and guess what? They can immediately expand their patient panel. So now that one doctor can almost double the number of people that can uh, go to their clinic. So now more people have access to a family doctor. And not only that, what they find is that actually nurses are better at a lot of things than doctors are, actually. And in a lot of these mechanisms, like if you actually look at suture, suture care, blood pressure, uh, putting in ear stints, we're not using them. They're a full scope of practice. We're only using them in hospitals, really. There's just some doctors that have independently figured this out, but what they do is they get the payment and they pay as a salary for the nurses. And most doctors are reluctant to do that because they think it's a money-losing venture. And in actual fact, most often nurses more than pay for themselves. So what I'm saying is, why are we not allowing nurses in family doctor's offices and primary health care to access the MSP billing system? They can already access the codes, they just can't get paid for it. One valid argument we often hear is oversight, and nurses don't have the full scope of practice. There isn't this over accountability. But what a lot of people don't realize is that, similar to doctors, the College of Physicians, there's also a college of nurses, basically, that oversees all the nurses. Thanks for the 30-second warning. And so, and there's actually other programs that are currently operated by the province right now where nurses have this expanded co uh, scope and are able to uh, operate within it. They're pilot programs. And so, and these frameworks, these uh, frameworks of accountability have already been identified and put into place. Nurses actually can access the MSP system. They just can't get paid through it. And so, just to put this in perspective, about one in five of all emergency room visits in the year are made by patients, people who don't have a family doctor, that have a non-urgent, non-emergency issue, okay? Each emergency room visit uh, costs on average, this is the latest stats, about $304 to taxpayers. Do you know that actually if those people were able to access a family doctor's office, the average cost is $33. One-tenth of the cost is way more expensive for people to go into an emergency room than it is to go to a family doctor. They also clog up emergency rooms for non-emergency issues because they don't have a family doctor. And that, that is literally one-tenth. If you extrapolate the numbers, it's about $127 million a year provincially in BC with 2020 numbers that could be saved by getting people to go to their family doctor's office instead of an emergency room. And we could do that by allowing nurses to actually get payment for being in primary health care. And we do this in our clinics. We pay out of pocket for nurses, and we're able to expand and uh, look after a larger panel of patients. And our quality health, our health care, health care outcomes and quality of care are phenomenal. We actually did a patient satisfaction survey and we share data with Interior Health all the time. This is the future. We should be doing this. And it's something we can do right now to immediately increase people's ability to access primary care. 
And so what the Chamber actually recommends is that the Ministry of Health expand the ex existing MSP billing code uh, to make it available for RNs and MPs to reflect the services within their provincially regulated scope of practice, in addition to the existing limited health uh, authority salary positions. Number two, that the Ministry of Health expand the membership in the General Practice Services Committee, uh, GPSC, to include RNs and MPs to help further identify ways to reduce barriers and support implementation of team-based primary health care. And these changes would be a giant step forward in ca for Canada to catch up with the rest of the world when we're talking about providing long-term benefits to team-based care. And finally, I'll end by echoing sentiments brought forward by the BC Chamber and other chambers. If I can leave you with only one message today, it would be this. Budget 2022-23 needs to use the policy levers of government to provide more certainty. Certainty for workers, certainty for businesses, and for those looking to invest in British Columbia. The pandemic has taken an emotional and financial toll on businesses and their employees, and businesses need certainty to recover and thrive. Thank you very much. That was very fast. Near the end, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I Lots. think we do have time for a few questions. Harwinder. Thank you, Colin. Really appreciate your presentation, and thank you for highlighting the issue about nurse practitioners. Um, and uh, I, I'm not biased towards my former colleagues, but I've heard from many patients. Uh, when you were saying something, I think the reason we highly respect doctors and the team work we do, but I think uh, maybe one of the reasons uh, we've heard from patients, the nurse, they would rather have nurse practitioner. Again, it's not a competition, but nurse spend 12 to 16 hours with the patient when doctor two uh, minutes, the max. So I think, um, being a nurse, like we develop, we don't just get to know about uh, history, we get family dynamics, even if there was abuse, like, you know, the all day long, the dialogue. So maybe that's what gets embedded when some of the nurses go for nurse practitioners. Sadly, in the beginning, when a nurse practitioner program was launched, there was opposition from doctors. You know, uh, we don't take a change, uh, accept it. We always find change threatening, but now later they saw it's complementary to the healthcare. I've heard this from many of my nurse colleagues, former colleagues, I must say. They've done nurse practitioner and this billing issue. It's uh, inequality, it's disparity. They get salary and they do a lot of work within the hospitals, urgent primary care center. And I really, for that, I really appreciate you having this dialogue and something our committee should consider very seriously and there are more and more nurses are doing nurse practitioner program and they've had masters they have 30 plus years experience and uh, really? no wonder the satisfaction survey was uh, yep. very I should also mention that we are actually starting to attract now doctors from other provinces that look to this model doctors like the team based model as well it's actually very attractive and so we have actually been able to attract uh, we're going up to a half a dozen doctors this year alone which is pretty phenomenal if you know anything about doctor attraction but it is it's higher quality healthcare outcomes is what comes out of this and it's working together in a team in primary healthcare so it makes financial sense, it'll save taxpayers a pile of money, it'll get people access to doctors, and healthcare providers like it. They enjoy actually the environment. A quick follow-up. So it's sad to, for me to see some of my colleagues recently, uh, one moved to Yukon because of the funding and billing system, so something we should consider so we can keep the talent home where we need it. But it's reassuring for me to see the doctors, they're seeing nurse practitioners as complementary and good teamwork. It's uh, shifted certainly, but we need more work to do. So Absolutely. I should also have mentioned that this policy is built in partnership with doctors and nurses. So it is very operationally based. It is not, uh, not something that's made behind a desk. This is actually from on the ground people that are doing this stuff. And so this is something we can implement very easily, very quickly. They literally can access the system already. They're just not paid through it. Right. It's like flipping a switch. So I'm, I'm really sorry. We're going to have to wrap it up. We're That's way right. behind time. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but I want to thank you uh, for making the presentation. And uh, thank you for your leadership on this. And um, this, is, um, this is something that has, has uh, uh, come to the committee uh, before. Uh, so um, it's, uh, it's a new idea, but it's not an out there idea. And um, I, I really look forward to our deliberations as a committee uh, to talk about um, how we can uh, work with you to move forward on what makes so much sense. That's fantastic. Okay. Thank you very much for Thank your time. You.
Okay, we'll now uh, recess until 5.05.
Okay, we'll um, reconvene the committee. Um, our next presenter is Tanji uh, Jenshorik, um, Away Home Kamloops. So Tanji, you have uh, five minutes to make your presentation. We'll keep track, uh, we'll time it with our phones. When you have 30 seconds, um, we'll signal uh, so that you know to wrap it up. And then uh, the next five minutes will be question and answer. Okay, so you have a total of 10 minutes. Oh, wonderful. Thank you so much. So I'm the executive director of Away Home Kamloops. Uh, we're a youth-serving organization here in town. So we, we house and support youth ages 16 to 26. Uh, a variety of, of uh, different youth, um, at-risk youth experiencing or at risk of homelessness all the way through um, youth who are a little bit more independent and just in need of some financial support. So we provide housing and we provide wraparound support. So life skills, education, employment, connections to community, connections to health and mental health services, um, addiction services. And we work at meeting youth where they're at and working with their own intrinsic motivations to develop goals and wellness plans. So we're really a youth voice centered organization. We were founded by Catherine McParland, who was a former uh, youth in care herself. Um, she founded the organization in 2018. It started a few years before that, incorporated in 2018. She passed away on December 4th. We're really excited to be um, partnering with the province to create uh, a really important memorial project to Catherine. It'll be 39 units of youth housing that'll be uh, breaking ground here soon, as, as soon as possible, probably occupied in the next couple of years. Um, we expect that that building to be a huge success. Um, we, we would like to advocate for more buildings of that type in our province. So youth housing is, uh, you know, like I mentioned, it, it comes in a variety of forms, all the way from supporting youth who are at risk of homelessness, uh, youth who are experiencing a variety of mental health issues, um, a variety of uh, addiction issues, and a variety of, of social issues. So um, we often require intensive supports for our youth, 24-7 um, support for a lot of them. Um, the Youth Housing First practice is a best practice that places youth directly into housing, regardless of what their needs are, um, regardless of, of where they're at in any of those pieces, mental health or addictions or, or any of their needs. Uh, the idea is that Housing First is the best solution to anyone's problems. So um, we work with that, and that means that a minimum of a one case manager must be provided for every seven youth. So that's a, a guiding factor that can really, um, really assist youth in, in finding success so that we can ensure that all of the wraparound supports are provided because they have a lot of contact with the, their support workers. The case manager is just one piece of the puzzle, though. There has to be a whole host of supports around them, um, depending on what their own needs are and what that looks like for each of them. Um, other things that we need to provide in the housing itself are, of course, food, clothing, hygiene items, transportation to access things like reg recreation, education, and employment. Uh, providing a housing unit itself is simply not enough. So while we're looking at providing, asking for more provision of youth-specific housing all across the province, we, we need to really um, remember that that comes with a whole host of supports and 24-7 staffing in a lot of cases as well. So it's not just uh, increasing budgets for youth-specific housing, but continuing sustainable operational funding for those, those housing units in a really robust wraparound way. So those specific, those specific supports are, um, like I mentioned, all the life skills that need to be taught to the youth. So youth need to be basically uh, supported in a way that uh, a youth would normally have a family around them to teach everything that, that they learn. So all of the life skills around cooking and hygiene, learning to drive, all of the things that we take for granted that our children will learn from us or that we'll teach to our children, we need to provide those in, in different forms through our staffing models. So they, they also need, they need, 
they need the life skills training, recreation, social activities, but they also need clinical supports, um, health specific services, mental health and counseling services, um, often addiction services, including um, detox and long term recovery options that are youth focused and youth specific. Um, you know, adult youth, adult adult services, um, whether they're detox or or other, are not uh, not suitable for a lot of a lot of youth. So. Um, all of these things are, are really uh, really important to, to young people, but we have we have been working on one solution um, that's Catherine's law that will become a concrete means for ensuring that no one um, ages out of care. So the idea is that we take the COVID measures that are put in place right now um, that are keeping have put a moratorium on youth aging out of foster care and make those permanent. So that's our real, you know, all of the things that I mentioned before, we can keep providing those on and on and on and on, or we can look at stopping the highway into homelessness from the foster care system. So a big, big budget piece going into MCFD, extending care, continuing care past the age of majority, and another big housing piece, or another big budget piece going into BC Housing, providing those housing models with operational dollars. I don't have any specific numbers on any of those budget items. <laughs> Just <That>. more. <laughs> okay, thank you, Tanji. Yeah. Um, and I'll invite the committee uh, to ask uh, any questions. Harwinder. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Tanji, uh, for your presentation and for the work you do. It's a life changing and really appreciate. You mentioned uh, the recommendation for one case manager for seven youth. What is the ratio right now? Or is there no uh, ratio? Well, I think historically it's been more up around nine. Um, right now, everyone has really limited staffing and it's, it's above that. Um, and I think. I think a lot of people are sitting around 10, you know, a case manager for 10, even 12 youth at this point, given the, the restrictions on staffing at this point, given COVID and, and a number of factors that are making it really difficult for everyone to hire people. And yeah. Thank you. And in my understanding, you have to take whoever comes in the door, and it is a complex work. And, the, you know, the resources you have to link these youth with. So thank you for... Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mike. Thank you, Chair, and, and thank you, Tanji. Um, you can't see a smile behind a mask, but there was one there the whole time uh, for the work that you're doing. Uh, when we think of Maslow's hierarchy of needs, these, these youth need a place to, to keep them dry. They don't need to wonder where the next couch is, so that's the first step in, in, in what it is that they need. So my question's around... Uh, the wraparound services uh, that you've probably made uh, great relationships with other other agencies that there so it leads me to like what is is there a wait time for the youth to get into into your into your building and what's the what kind of wait times are there for these youth to get the services that you've identified that they need yeah thanks for that the um, we have right now we have um, 35 youth in our housing and we have 55 youth on our wait list and those 55 youth on that wait list can be waiting up to two years. Oh. Yeah. The housing market is so tight right now, right? And there's, there's very little youth-specific housing, very, very little. Okay, thank you. Uh, well, uh, not seeing any other questions. Um, on behalf of the committee, I'd like to uh, thank you for your presentation. Uh, thank you for the work that you do, and I, I also think on behalf of the committee, I um, uh, can offer you um, our condolences uh, for your loss, and uh, what, uh, what you're doing uh, is an incredible legacy in order to, uh, to remember uh, what she started and what she did. Thank you so thank much you. for saying that. Thanks for your time today, everyone. And our next uh, presenter is Amber uh, Papu, a Self-Design Learning Foundation. So Amber, you have uh, five minutes. Uh, we'll signal you when you should be wrapping it up at 30 seconds, and then uh, five minutes for uh, the, the committee to ask you questions and for you to respond. Great. Thank you very much. Um, and thank you very much to the committee this afternoon for inviting me here to talk about something I'm incredibly passionate about, and that is education in BC. Uh, as mentioned, my name is Amber Papo. No one 
says it right. So, my, my, my <laughs> you did pretty either. close. <laughs> um, my name is Amber Papo, and I'm the president and CEO of the Self Design Learning Foundation. I've worked over 25 years in a number of sectors in the province, including economic development, uh, tourism, skills training, education, and technology. Uh, the Self Design Learning Foundation has been around for approximately 40 years. We uh, offer programs and services that are based on our philosophy, which is self-design, and it's focused on how learning happens um, <clears throat> Pardon me, um, in our communities and environment with each other and also within ourselves. Uh, the philosophy itself is closely aligned with many indigenous learning philosophies, and as such, um, our organization is committed to shared responsibility and um, uh, reconciliation. Um, each year we contract about 2,000 individuals to help support our program, which makes us one of the largest fully remote organizations, not only in BC, but also in Canada. Um, the organization provides uh, services to individuals around the world. Um, we are the first online school in the world to be accredited with an organization called Cognia. Um, Cognia re represents thousands of schools and educators and millions of students um, in 84 countries across the world. Here in BC, um, we are pioneers in online education. We've been operating one of the largest independent online schools for K-12 in the province for the past 20 years. It's called the Self-Designed Learning Community. Our school offers a very unique program in the province. Uh, not only are we fully aligned with the BC curriculum and educational outcomes as per the Ministry of Education, but we are fully inclusive and we're very proud of our um, support and partnerships, not only with SOGI123, but also with um, organizations such as the um, uh, Gord Downey Foundation. Um, our program is tuition-free for BC students, uh, largely due to the association with our foundation. Um, we do offer a program that is online. However, our programs are very focused on project-based thematic learning. So computers are not used as teaching tools. They're used as communication tools. Um, we are unique in the, in the province for um, either public online brick-and-mortar schools or independent schools in that we are a school of record for 2,000 learners. Um, having said that, what that means is that we offer a fully inclusive program for kids that are either gifted in kindergarten. It's the same program that's offered to adult learners with special needs. Our student um, to teacher ratio is, well, I should say teacher to student ratio is very small. It's 1 to 33. Um, to put it in perspective, in a normal, typical high school, that ratio is 1 to about 184 to 200 students. We have approximately 200 certified teachers in the um, BC certified teachers that help support a program. Of those, 65 are specialized in working with children with special needs. And that leads me to what makes us truly unique in the province, is we are the largest um, provider of, of educational services to students with special needs in the province. And that's regardless of whether it's public brick and mortar, independent brick and mortar, or online. Um, currently, there's 3,700 learners uh, enrolled in online programs with special needs, and we provide services for about a third of those. Um, <clears throat> I'd like to start by saying that I really acknowledge, and I truly do, given my background as a certified teacher, that I believe that the ministry does do things um, in the best interest of families and learners in the province. However, I do have several concerns about changes that have been implemented and are about to be implemented to online education in the province. Um, first, in 2020, uh, independent online schools received a decrease in per-student funding of 20%. Um, <clears throat> for our school, although we have a close association with the foundation for support, we did not um, have the same impact that other um, schools had. Um, but that put in perspective, we operate at 40% of what... Um, a standard, typical brick-and-mortar school does in terms of student funding. The second thing is there are proposed changes in online education, and there's a level, a high level of uncertainty of how those changes are going to affect independent schools, and in particular, independent schools that support online, uh, sorry, uh, children with special needs. So in closing, what we're looking for and what I'm hopeful is that the ministry continues to support online education for all learners, and in particular for vulnerable learners, such as those that are supported through self Design Learning Foundation, who has supported the most vulnerable learners in the province for the past 40 years. Thanks very much. 
Thank you, Amber. Um, and now I'll invite members of the committee uh, to ask questions. And the first one who's indicated is uh, Megan, followed by Lauren. Hi, Amber. It's nice to see you again. Nice to see you too, Megan. Um, I just have two quick questions. So one's just uh, to confirm. So about 700 of your 2,000 students are low incidence in the enrollment of the, of the entire program. So yeah, actually, it's yeah, a little bit more, about 740. Okay, so wow, that's quite significant. And then with your special needs program that has 150 students on the wait list, is that because of student ratio requirements, because these are students that would have a different difficult uh, time in class, or why have you had to run a wait list? Generally speaking, the way in which we operate is we have a thousand... Usually, right now, we have 1,000 learners that are with special needs. 750 for those, this is a little technical, our low incident receive 100% of funding from the province right. for, their, for the challenges that they're faced with. An, an additional 250 are considered high incident. Those learners are generally children with um, challenges, behavioral and otherwise, that are not funded by the province. And so we need to, and we do, fund them with what we receive in per student rates, which again are 60% le less than what a typical brick and mortar receives. Okay. And you just can't accommodate the additional 150 or And we can't accommodate. On Last year, we had a 2,000 student wait list. This year, we try to go in and out, and we're about 150 right now, just because it's the start of the school year. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, thank you. You're welcome. Uh, just before you start, Lauren, um, uh, there's a, we're having trouble hearing up here. Uh, oh, sorry. So could we, um, if we could close the door, that would help. <laughs> that would help a lot. Uh, and then just uh, if everyone at that end of the room just... Uh, uh, speak up more because this is important and we don't sure, want to I will do that I can yeah. speak loud <laughs> I missed some words <laughs> okay then I'll move it closer if I have a question okay, okay thanks sorry about that Lauren thank you madam chair um, for the last uh, number of days we've heard a lot about connectivity particularly of course in rural BC and certainly even some of our smaller communities um, I, uh, I wonder how that's impacting you. I know that in my riding of Caribou Chilcotin, there would be very many people that would love to uh, use your service, of course, because of uh, lack of access, honestly, to the town, you know, in a riding that's five or six hours across. Um, how is that impacting you folks? Mm -hmm. Well, internet connectivity definitely has an impact, I think, on all learners in the province, just given the necessity of computers these days. In regards to our program, yes, it is online. Um, we do have very many of our learners are in rural um, areas with very limited um, internet service or cell service, for that matter. We've try to accommodate them by partnering with different groups that within close um, with neighborhoods and, and cities and towns that are close to them to try to allow them to have access. But yes, it definitely does have an impact. I spent some considerable amount of time in the last couple of years um, working part time in northern BC in the Peace Region, and <laughs> it was difficult for me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Greg. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Amber, it's good to see you. Nice it's been you a number of years. Um, <clears throat> with respect to the reduction in funding, uh, you've indicated that uh, the funding that you receive is only 40% uh, of what a typical student would cost the province through brick and mortar school delivery. Is that correct? The per student rate, yes. Yeah. Um, has government provided any justification or rationale on why they cut funding for? Uh, the services that you provide that are already at a significant uh, savings over uh, the per student provincial funding? The short answer is not really. It was, they must have some justification for taking funds away from those students that don't have the same opportunity to maybe attend uh, the conventional school system. Yeah, there wasn't really anything. In fact, it was a bit of a shock to um, all independent online schools because we were right in the middle of the pandemic and most of us had offered our services to public and independent schools to help in terms of that process. And I can honestly say that other than at that particular time, online, independent online schools were receiving 63%, this, I don't, this is getting technical, 63% of what um, the public um, online schools were receiving in terms of per student funding. And the rationale we got from the ministry as close as I could was that they wanted to make that equitable to what other independent schools were receiving, which was 50% of what the public rate was. That's what we got. Well, that, that's 
<clears throat> excuse me, that, that's troubling. I think we all can appreciate the need for providing funding for our youth, for education. There's no more, uh, no more important area of funding in our province, and yet uh, funding was cut significantly. You said 20 percent. It was the equivalent of 20 percent of our per student funding, yes, which did affect and impact low in, our, our low incidence learners. Not to the same degree because they receive additional funding to support their their, um, their needs from the province, but are high incident learners, and those ones are the, some of the most vulnerable that cannot go to public schools for whatever reason or brick and mortars for that matter. That did affect them because that's all their funding. Sounds a bit heartless. It was hard. <laughs> Our model and just the way in which we work, we were able to support. So we had no changes to our programs and limited changes to staff. But we are also a charity, so it's a little different than some of the other schools. Well, thank you for what you do. Thank you. Okay, with that, um, we're out of time, Amber, but uh, thank you so much for your presentation. And uh, thank you for uh, alerting us to a, uh, to a situation that we will want to be talking about in much more detail in our deliberations before we make recommendations. And um, uh, yeah, I, think, I think the pandemic has shown us that online uh, learning is something that we need to be uh, uh, exploring in a lot more detail than we have in the past. Well, thank you, and thank you thank very you. much, everybody. Thank you. Our uh, next presenter is uh, Brett Fairbairn, uh, Thompson Rivers University. And I want to begin by acknowledging that we're on the unceded ancestral lands of Tecumlips to Sequapim. Tecumlips to Sequapim is our first house within Sequapim Kulu and our partner. And certainly this week in particular, our thoughts are with them. Um, Orange Shirt Day, you may know, was originated by Phyllis Webstad from our Williams Lake campus um, and has now been kind of taken over by the federal government. Um, but it's a, it's a solemn week for, uh, for remembrance of residential schools. I want to acknowledge the members of the committee, uh, particularly MLA Dirksen, who represents the, uh, the uh, Kamloops uh, Chilcotin riding where Williams Lake campus is located. And I want to thank all of you for your work. I know you're putting in very long hours and you have a lot of meetings. I won't repeat the contents of the written submission that I sent from TRU, but there are four points that I wanted to emphasize today. And the first one is simply that TRU and other research universities, other universities of all kinds, can help with the challenges that the province faces, including putting people first, uh, building a strong, sustainable economy, achieving lasting, meaningful reconciliation, and solving climate change. Uh, universities like ours have many impacts. One way to measure them is with economic impact. And to sum that up for us, we make a $700 million per year impact in our region and a $1.5 billion per year um, positive impact for the economy of British Columbia. A uh, second point I want to make is that our leadership role and our economic impact are increasingly about graduate programs. And I wanted to bring that to your attention. As I indicated in the materials, TRU has been increasing our number of graduate programs to meet student demand. Um, and we've done so with no corresponding increases in public funding. All of our graduate programs at TRU are self-funded entirely by the students through their tuition fees. And I suppose the disparity is greatest for our Faculty of Law, which is the only law program in the province that was created with no increase in provincial funding. Third point is that I think a strong sustainable recovery is going to require increased research funding especially. Uh, recovery in the interior means that we need faculty and graduate students and undergraduate students working on applied and basic research uh, specific to the needs of the interior. And I provided some examples in the materials that I shared. Um, one of the things that we're very excited about is the prospect of developing a tourism research centre that would be very closely um, uh, related to the economy of our region. I also wanted to mention that we partner with other universities in the interior. We're in an interior universities research consortium with our colleagues in Prince George and in Kelowna. And through them, we certainly collaborate and seek the establishment of an interior region research fund uh, to support all of our communities. 
And the fourth point I want to make is that the emerging economy that we see in the recovery is one that is going to require increased access to knowledge-intensive professions. Um, when we look at health sciences, we see the importance of health sciences in the pandemic right now and in the pressures in our health system. And we know as a university that we have excess demand for our BSN program, for healthcare assistant, for respiratory therapy, for nurse practitioner and we have much more that we can do in those areas. Um, I would also mention expansion um, beyond our, uh, soft, our uh, software engineering program to, full out, uh, to fill out electrical and computer engineering and to be training those highly qualified um, personnel in the interior of BC to meet the needs of our developing economy. So those were really the, the four points that I wanted to share. We're here to partner and we're here to help. Graduate programs are increasingly important for our students in our region. Investment in research is key. And that access to, to the knowledge-intensive professions, the preparation of highly qualified personnel, is critical for the future. Um, I hope that through this brief presentation that you'll have some sense of the role that universities like TRU can play in the recovery. And I want you to know that we're motivated by deep care for our students and for our communities. And that's what, uh, what inspires us to undertake the work that we do. Thank you very much. Thank you, Brett. And uh, now um, I'll ask for um, questions from uh, the committee. And uh, Megan has indicated she has questions, and Lauren has indicated he has questions. So we'll start with Megan. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you for the presentation. I really appreciated the in-depth uh, PowerPoint presentation you provided also. Uh, my question relates to your comment about graduate offerings being something that is uh, more and more important to your student body. Where are you seeing that in trust growing mostly? Because I see you offer quite a few. Is there, is there patterns or specific ones that are really seeking, seeing a lot of pressure? Um, in many ways, it's across the board. Certainly, uh, there's a lot of demand for graduate um, uh, degrees and diplomas and certificates in business, in uh, traditional fields that we've offered master's level uh, uh, training in, like education. Um, but I would say that we see many of the, the needs and opportunities in health sciences. We have not had a nurse practitioner program. We have one that's designed and has gone through stages of approval and is really ready to go. And we certainly see the urgent need for those practitioners in the interior. But I would also say that we have a new uh, master's in um, social justice that's an interdisciplinary collaboration between several of our faculties. So it isn't purely um, uh, technical or, or professional areas, but it is a, a wide demand by students for graduate credentials. Oh, wonderful. That's very interesting. Thank you so much. Lauren. Thank you, Madam Chair, and uh, thank you, Brad. It's nice to see you again. You are an excellent community partner in Williams Lake, and we're very glad to have you. Listen, we've heard hundreds of presentations over the last uh, number of weeks, and um, uh, there are shortfalls in almost every category. Can you speak to the capacity that you have to grow in, in your campuses, please? Mm -hmm. um, thank you very much, and I appreciate that the, the job at the provincial level is to deal with many more needs than there is funding to go around. Um, uh, certainly a, a difficult challenge. We have many opportunities. Some of them we can fund by reallocating internally. Some of them we require outside assistance and partnerships. Um, but I would say our potential to grow, if I think about student demand, one of the, um, uh, the two top areas of opportunity in post-secondary education these days are professional master's programs and programs in health sciences and health sciences broadly speaking so of course we have demand for nurses and we experience a need for nurses we hear that from our community partners um, uh, but also the the health sciences education at the at all levels that leads to the many other jobs um, beyond the typical ones we think of it's a big growth area for the future um, engineering as well thinking of the the software and computer industries. So those are some of the places where we have demand, we see opportunity to grow, and we see demand for graduates. Thank you. Thank you. We uh, probably have time for maybe one more question. Share group. 
<clears throat> Thanks a lot. Uh, the question I want to ask you is one of the recommendations you made is to, uh, in order to develop a strong, sustainable economy, uh, you are suggesting that we should invest some money in, in the research programs, and particularly you're here. You're asking Tourism Research Center here. So the question I want to ask you is, has there been any discussion uh, among the post-secondary institutions about this research program, like if there has been, and like what kind of discussion that has been? Mm -hmm. About tourism in particular? Tourism or, or overall generally. research funding for uh, yes. recovery and sustainable economy? Um, yes, so I'd say um, um, three things. Um, first, uh, we worked together with the Research Universities Council of British Columbia, who will also have met with you, and we coordinate our thinking around research and around priorities. So we work together through RUCBC, and in recent years we've been collaborating more and more with all the other universities and colleges in the public system. Um, so yes, at the province-wide level. And in the interior, we have an especially tight relationship with the University of uh, Northern British Columbia and Prince George and with the UBC Okanagan campus in Kelowna. Our um, um, uh, officials responsible for research, our faculty meet regularly and collaborate and have developed joint plans and proposals. And finally, I'd say that, that interesting research projects, especially in the interior, especially linked to the needs of the economy, involve partners beyond universities. So we're talking to the tourism industry, we're talking to um, indigenous organizations that are interested in sustainable and environmental and cultural tourism, and really building the alliances to support the research. Thank you. Well, with that, uh, Brett, I'd, on behalf of the committee, I would like to thank you for taking the time uh, to make the presentation. Um, and, um, you know, you talked about uh, the link between universities and a post-pandemic uh, recovery. And, you know, some of us have referred to that as creating the new normal. Mm -hmm. And it's pretty clear that we can't have a new normal without new ideas, new research, new knowledge, and that is uh, the role of a university. And so thank you for anticipating and rising to the occasion. And thank, thank you. you again to the committee for your work. Thank you. Our next uh, presenter is uh, Leif Douglas. Uh, Thompson Rivers University Students Union. So Leif, you have five minutes. Um, we'll be timing it. Uh, we'll give you the 30 second uh, warning to start wrapping it up. And then um, for, from there, we'll proceed to five minutes of questions and answers. Awesome, yeah, that sounds great. Um, yeah, so my name's uh, Leif Douglas. I work for the TRU Students Union. I'm the campaign's coordinator there. Um, I work there as staff, so I'm no longer a student there. Um, first of all, I just want to thank each of you on the committee for your time today. Um, we really appreciate it. Um, we have four recommendations for the committee today. I believe you have our document in front of you there. Um, I'll just get right into it. Our first recommendation is to expand the BC Access Grant in response to COVID-19. Um, first of all, why a grants program? Well, it's the best form of student financial aid. Um, it's the most effective at, um, one, helping students participate who wouldn't otherwise be able to, two, supporting students to complete their education, so get all, all the way through their degree, and then three, assist graduates in transitioning from study into employment. Um, so the provincial government implemented a need-based grant system in fall 2020 already for post-secondary students. So I'd like to thank this committee for their consistent support of this recommendation um, over the last decade or so, and to the government for actually moving the program forward. Um, it's been really important and impactful, I think, to students. In recovering from the ongoing pandemic, though, access to education and training um, will be increasingly important. And so this is why we're recommending that the provincial government mirror what the federal government has done and expand the value of the grants program in the upcoming years um, to help support people in British Columbia in terms of education and retraining. Our second recommendation is to establish a provincial jobs program for post-secondary students. 
Um, this recommendation is sort of also directly related to pandemic recovery. Some provinces, such as Ontario, Manitoba, Saskatchewan, have already launched their own provincial jobs programs to augment the federal program. Um, the start of the COVID pandemic revealed how vulnerable um, particularly students and young people are. Um, as of January, Statistics Canada reported that 15 to 24 year olds represented 45% of net employment losses um, since the start of the pandemic. A provincial jobs program could help to not only sort of mitigate employment issues, but also strengthen um, our economy here in British Columbia. Our third recommendation is to create a provincial strategy for international students. Um, currently, it is up to every university or college in BC to recruit as many international students as sort of they think they can accommodate. Um, and the, the challenge is that there's no real consistency both for those institutions but also for international students themselves and the type of, the, of educational experience they might have here in British Columbia. Um, and so for institutions, there can also be significant financial uncertainty without that sort of provincial strategy in place in terms of what might be happening with all different regulations coming from the government. Um, so for this reason, we support the provincial government in creating a provincial strategy for international students for here in British Columbia. Um, our final recommendation is to restore apprenticeship offices to support post-secondary trades training. Um, so this summer, the BC government announced they'd be bringing back mandatory trades training, um, starting with 10 trades. We support this change as we believe it will contribute to workplaces um, having a high level of safety, um, where all workers are appropriately trained, and that workers are paid fairly. Um, but with this change, we also believe there'll be some increased challenges as a growing number of British Columbians are either coming back for retraining or maybe seeking trades training for the first time in greater numbers. And so for this reason, we're recommending the return of institution-specific apprenticeship offices um, that can help meet the unique needs of these students, such as connecting them with employers, um, assisting with financial aid or other issues. So that are our four recommendations um, for this year. Once again, thank you for your time and I'd be happy to take any questions from you folks. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you, Leif. Uh, so, yes, I'll um, uh, turn it over to the uh, committee to ask uh, your questions. Thank you very much uh, for your presentation. Actually, uh, I did this um, about three years ago, and uh, at that time I saw the uh, number of student union uh, representative coming to make recommendations. So they may have done that because I just came uh, a day before and became a member of this, this committee. But the number of student un union was very, very high at that time. And uh, but this, there may be some sort of coordination going on, which I don't know. But the question I want to ask you is this. Uh, the, you were recommending the um, provincial job program for students. And you also mentioned that other programs, other provinces have done something up in this direction. So what this program will look like, if you can just explain to that, what will that program be? Totally, yeah. I, I think it's, it looks different in different provinces. Some do it fairly small scale, others bigger. I think the intent generally is to sort of augment what the federal government is doing and sort of not try to obviously compete with that program. The federal government shifted their program so it's no longer just for post-secondary students, it's for young people in general, I think to sort of reach a wider base of people. Um, our recommendation honestly doesn't have that much detail in it because mm -hmm. we thought it would be important to sort of maybe look specifically at what could we do in BC, um, how could we sort of help support students and young people starting their careers, and what can we do where the federal government sort of isn't very active. And honestly, it's a little challenging to find data from the federal government in terms of what they do with their jobs program. It seems to shift a fair bit year to year in terms of number of positions and funding and things like that. But it came up out of the sort of after the pandemic started, there was a lot of concern amongst young people finding jobs. And obviously, it's really hard to start a jobs program if one doesn't already exist. And so our intent with the recommendation would be to sort of look at hopefully do some coordination with the federal government and then have a program in BC here that's specific to BC students to help students find employment, get experience, things like that, that can really then, if we have future challenges, if we're going through, you know, future things related to COVID, can be sort of nimble and help students and help our economy, if that makes sense. 
Um, but yeah, I wish I had sort of more specific details okay, to give you on thanks. that front. Yeah. I also appreciate your, um, your recommendation about the international students. I think uh, something needs to be done there. So I don't need you to make any comments, but I just want to make a comment myself. Thank you. Thank you. Mike. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, and thank you, Lee, for your presentation. Um, with regards to uh, your comments about institution-specific apprenticeship offices, um, how many offices do you see this happening, happening uh, out there as opposed to like a centralized one? Or, or conversely, uh, some of the uh, unions that are out there that are involved in those 10 labor uh, uh, jobs that are out there reaching out to you uh, at the campus level? So you're asking how, how many offices would we be kind of proposing? And yeah. Yeah, I mean, I would say our, our idea was around it was to have one for every single institution that's doing trades training. It's a bit beyond, as I understand it in BC, what I've been told, it's maybe a bit beyond my years. That was something we used to have in BC. And a pre trade students get a lot more support in terms of saying, maybe you're done your second year and you need to find a job. It can be a big challenge. My brother is going through electrical training. It can be a big challenge finding you know, a placement, things like that. And a centralized system just isn't that effective at helping students with those specific needs to maybe find a placement in your community. Maybe you're looking for something that's a work camp where you can fly to, sort of meeting those specific needs. Maybe you have students who have special needs in terms of financial aid to sort of get them through. And so basically to have less of a central approach and more of a let's have an office everywhere where trades training is happening to support those students, especially if we're seeing a bump in enrollment due to sort of mandatory trades training, if that makes sense. Uh, yes, it does. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much. Any other uh, questions? Well, Leif, your, uh, your uh, presentation was, uh, was very clear, very specific. I want to thank you on behalf of the committee for taking the time to come and um, uh, offer us some uh, very uh, concrete uh, uh, solutions and uh, things that we can work with. And I, I do look forward to the deliberation. I, I will say that, you know, as, as you were talking about the uh, provincial jobs program, um, you know, I, sadly, it is not a new idea. I... Uh, I I may be one of the only ones who, in the room who remember benefiting from a program like that. It was uh, many, many decades ago, uh, but they work in terms of matching students with employers. Yeah. And so I, thank you for reminding yeah. us about that. <laughs> yeah. No, thank you. I think it's only increasingly important as there's more and more students seeking education and you know, job experience for students is becoming increasingly important to sort of differentiate or find career paths or things like that. And so that was kind of what we looked at. So I, I appreciate the comments. Thank you so much. And thank you, thank you to everyone on the committee. We pre really appreciate your time. Thank you. Okay, our next presenter is Heather Grieve, a school district number 73, Kamloops Thompson. I feel like that was a tough act to follow. <laughs> it, was, it was very, um, very put together. Uh, so I wanted to take a minute just to introduce myself. My name is Heather Grieve. I am one of the elected school trustees for the city of Kamloops, um, which is both an urban and rural district. I'm one of the urban uh, trustees. Um, I want to say that we respectfully honor and acknowledge that we are meeting on the Shaquapnik Kulu, the land of the Shaquapnik people. Um, I understand that uh, members of the committee have gotten a PowerPoint presentation, is that correct, from our district? Is anyone aware of that? <laughs> okay. Um, Maybe what I'll do is give a brief overview, because uh, I don't necessarily want to go through a presentation, but I'll talk about things and then we can send it and follow up for you. Um, so our district, uh, School District 73, is located in British Columbia's southern interior. We have 27,000 square kilometres. Our municipalities include Chase, Barrier, Logan Lake, uh, and Clearwater, and many smaller communities such as Savannah, south to Westwold, and north to Blue River. Um, this is a brief presentation, and our big question for our district right now is how full is too full in terms of our schools. So we've really been in a situation with our um, existing buildings and infrastructure to have to try to find space for 
a rapidly growing district um, within the urban centre of Kamloops where our spaces that we might appear to have on paper are really in our rural and remote areas within our district. Um, for reference, Camels to Clearwater is 140 kilometres one way. Camels to Blue River is 230 kilometres or a two and a half hour drive one way. This is by car, not by bus. And our district is relatively the size of Belgium. If we were looking to move students to places where there are spaces, we would be having our students travel by bus for hours upon hours. Um, as it exists right now, SD73 buses over 5,000 students uh, over 9,000 kilometers per day. We have a population that is approximately 16,000 students uh, as of September 21st, 2021. We are the sixth largest geographical district. We are the 12th largest in enrollment within our province. Busing kids to our rural municipalities means that students are on the bus for two plus hours per day. This is not an option. If we were to take our most crowded elementary school, at this point it is in West Bend Elementary and West Side here in Kamloops, and travel to Blue River, which is one of the few places in Kamloops or in our district in elementary school that has space, uh, enough to accommodate the number of students that need it, our students would be on a bus for 5.5 hours per day in order to get them there. So in addition, our urban area really has limited walkability between schools. So we've gone through five catchment area changes just in the last year alone to try to make accommodations. We no longer have uh, easily accessible neighborhood schools. We are busing more students. Uh, and the reason why we're making decisions to change catchments is in hopes that we're finding the right balance of saying, you know what, we have students right now who are uh, learning through um, lessons being taught in portables. They get one gym class a week in our elementary schools because they are so overcrowded. So we're opting to move them to areas outside of their neighborhoods. Um, this is not something that has been a very popular decision with a large number of our community members and rightfully so. Um, we are growing at the rate of one elementary school each year, uh, approximately 250 students per year, uh, which is equal to one medium-sized elementary school. Our district is straight up in enrollment trajectory. So again, this is why we bring back that question of how full is too full. Um, the population growth in BC interior, uh, we are outpacing districts in the interior and comparable to the next largest district, which is Kelowna. SD73 is outpacing all surrounding districts in the interior and our facilities are impacted by this growth. Uh, we are at 102% capacity in our urban schools. Um, urban schools, so that's 36 schools in Camelot's proper. We are at 102%. By 2026, if nothing changes, SD73 will have 67% of all of its schools over 100% capacity, with 30% of these schools in Kamloops over 159%, sorry, 149% capacity. SD73 uh, urban portables, we have 63 portables that are attached to 17 of our schools within Kamloops right now, which is 38% of our schools. Our catchment area changes are not solving our space issues. And again, how full is too full? Less than 5% is left for early learners and fine arts. So at the pace that we're going, there's less than 5% in our district for fine arts, music art, specialized supports, computers and early learning, strong starts, seamless daycare and daycare in Montessori. Montessori, sorry. Um, Really, this is in the urban schools, but with the mandate letter for 2023 indicating that preschools will be a part of our education's mandate, we're not sure how we're going to accommodate that. Oh, sorry. And um, again, we are a rapidly growing urban rural district. Our urban growth has exceeded the space that we have in Kamloops. What we are asking for, criteria that is defined and transparency throughout the ministry in terms of its decisions, and we can't meet the bar if we don't know what it is. Please tell us what that bar is. Again, we ask that question, how full is too full? Thank you very much. Thank you, Heather. Uh, and uh, I see there are questions. So we'll start with Megan. Thank you, Madam Chair, and uh, thank you for your presentation. It gave me flashbacks of <laughs> 10 years. I was on the Langley Board of Education, much the same as you, urban, rural growth. and. How many schools um, is your district, uh, both elementary, middle, and senior, I don't know if you're in a middle model, suspect that you are down right now, will need in the next five years? 
and just to be sure that um, I caught it on the notes, you're you're looking for a clearer criteria to understand how, when you do your uh, facilities plan, when and how these will get funded. Yeah, and so that's, um, it's exactly it. So right now we're at a growth of, uh, we said like a medium-sized elementary school each year. Our secondary schools um, are extremely overcrowded and on our capital plan we have um, both upgrades and expansions. Um, Valley View was our most recent uh, announcement, which was two years ago. So I think mm -hmm. fall of 2018 it was announced just after the last election. Mm -hmm. um, but our uh, secondary schools, especially on the South Shore, so on one side of Kamloops, are extremely overcrowded. Mm -hmm. uh, North Shore area overcrowded. West side, there's one sort of high school within, and we don't work really with a middle school model. We have one middle school, okay. um, is under that 100% uh, capacity. But again, it would be a significant bus ride for people to travel from or be able to commute to that area. And just to follow up very briefly, Manager, I yes. promise, uh, do you have a 10-year long-term facilities plan completed? Yes, we have all of our long-term care, uh, sorry, long-term care, long-term projections, long-term uh, facility plans uh, in place. Um, we have a fantastic department within our district that has done a great job of projecting, finding out from city where building starts are happening, trying to anticipate how many students are going to be moving into different areas within our city as well. All right. Thank you yeah. so much. You're very welcome. Uh, Greg. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Heather, for your presentation. Um, <clears throat> you mentioned that there, you're currently operating with 66, 63 portables. Yes. Um, what is the average number of students per classroom that are in a portable? Uh, it really depends on the grade. Um, and I am not entirely sure class size and composition. It would depend uh, between elementary and secondary. But I know that at some of like uh, Westmount Elementary, I believe we have an elementary school in the North Shore, or sorry, in West Side right now that has seven portables. So almost 50% of their students are being taught in a portable. So again, they don't have lockers in the portables, they don't have washrooms in the portables, they don't have access to any of those things. So the 63 are spread throughout um, very congested areas within our, within our city. Sure, just trying to get a, a rough idea on numbers, like there would be 20 students on average per portable or something like that, just to get an idea of the total number of students that are actually in portables. Oh, any given I see. Time. Um, yeah, so it would be uh, classroom size and composition, so it's a bit more in secondary, but I think probably on average you'd be looking at 23 to 25 students per portable would be my best estimate based on size and composition. So about 1,300 students. And has that grown over the last five years or so, or...? Has it been exponentially? Yeah, we are consistently looking at uh, bringing portables in as a way of managing. Um, there's not sort of, <laughs> there's not really a year that has gone by that we are not planning for losing more parking spot, less parking lot space uh, to fit more portables in at our schools throughout our district. So Valley View, I think, was the last school that was announced in School District 73. Yeah. It was in 2018. But even with that new school coming on, you're still seeing incremental increase in portables year over year. Year over year, yes. And and Valley View is not at its completion date yet, so the portables are still existing there. They have already been earmarked for other areas within our district. It's not like we're not going to put them to use. And we did actually get... We had an, um, an announcement around Pineview having a new elementary school built, but again, that is scratching the surface of our of our challenges. Um, it's not it's not sort of our capital announcements to date are not solving our our enrollment pressures. So based on um, the numbers you provided, you're indicating that you almost need to add one additional school every year. Yeah, honestly, if we up. had a capital announcement every year for the next five years or six years, we would be... That would just maintain where you're at. It wouldn't even improve it. Yeah, and we're not even talking about the age of our infrastructure, right? Like, that's just... Those would be new builds and not talking about even the upkeep to our buildings as they stand right now. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you. So we're out of time, Heather. Um, but I, um, I want to thank you on behalf of the committee. And I'm also... Um, uh, uh, remembering that you started off your presentation by saying that that was a tough act to follow. <laughs> and uh, you did a really good job following that act. Uh, I think everyone, regardless of what uh, community that we come from, we're aware uh, from the teacher's perspective. We've been told by the teachers of the challenge of teaching in crowded classrooms. You have given us uh, an entirely different uh, and additional perspective of uh, of, of that and uh, the thought of, I took a school bus <laughs> and uh, the, the thought of being on a school bus for five hours 
my goodness. Yeah. Um, so thank you for um, sharing with us the reality of your crisis. Thank you very much thank for you. your time. Have a great day. Stay safe, everybody. You too. And we have uh, one more presenter, uh, and that's uh, Carolyn Boomer, uh, Pacific Sport Interior, BC. So, uh, Carolyn, you have uh, five minutes to make your presentation. We will give you uh, the, uh, a signal at 30, when you have 30 seconds left so that you can wrap it up, and then followed by five minutes of questions and answers. Okay, thank you. As mentioned, I'm Carolyn Boomer, the Executive Director for Pacific Sport and Interior BC, and I'm grateful to live, work, and play in the Shishwapmik territory, specifically to come up to Shishwapmik. And I say that in acknowledgement as a sign of reconciliation and cultural revitalization. Thank you to the Standing Committee. I know you're away from home, and uh, I do appreciate all your time dedicated to the process, and of course, uh, I'm a face-to-facer, so I really appreciate that. Pacific Sport Interior BC was established as the first name regional centre in our province by the provincial government shortly after Kamloops hosted the 1993 Canada Summer Games. And I had the pleasure of being the executive director, starting with a phone and, and uh, a desk, basically, uh, 26 years ago. And our success really relies on partnerships and relationships. Um, we have formed three main pillars, physical literacy, sport development, and sport performance in 18 interior-based communities. And I'm pleased to have our entire sports sector collectively united in requesting an additional $12 million over three years. This will allow our sector to deliver on government priorities as outlined in the BC Sport Pathway. I would like to share two stories to show impact in sport and why it's a good investment for government. We have recently come off the 2020 Olympic and Paralympic Games where Pacific Sport is one organization that supports athletes and coaches in our region. BC Connected athletes contributed to winning an impressive 50% of Team Canada's 24 medals, which was a record for Canada in a non-boycotted Canada Summer Olympic Games or sorry, Olympic Summer Games. On the Paralympic side, BC Connected athletes won 48% of Canada's medals, despite comprising only 30% of the team for a total of 21 medals. This, these amazing performances in such trying times with the pandemic has truly been an unbelievable feat to come to fruition. The world came together for the power of sport, uniting us in peace and the sheer joy of a competition. One such athlete you may recall is Greg Stewart from Kamloops, who won the gold medal and broke a Paralympic record in shot put in the F46 category. Greg is 7 feet 2 inches and was born with not a full arm. And prior to Greg leaving for Tokyo, we asked him if he would uh, join us in our Explore Sport camps for kids aged 7 to 12, and he agreed, of course. The children were like magnets to him, and while he played games with them and they listened intently to um, his story of journey of being born without a full arm, he spoke to them about the mental challenges he faced when he was at their age and provided realized coping strategies for when you're having a bad day. He provided an inspirational message to go over what, whatever dreams you, work, you have, work hard, and believe in yourself. And there's a testimonial from a parent that I'd like to share with you. My son Reed was so moved and inspired by the camp today, specifically the opportunity to meet Greg Stewart. It was the first time Reed's ever watched the Olympics on TV, and he was blown away to meet a real Olympian. He was buzzing all evening. Well done to you and the team for having him come and interact with the group. Just brilliant. Reed was bragging to everyone that he got to play sports with an actual Olympian. He won't soon forget it. It was a great week, and the concept of trying a variety of sports is so great. Reed loved the rock climbing, and we have now registered him in the Kamloops Track and Field Club. Keep up the amazing work, Robin. This is the power of sport as it, as it ignites generations to try and find their passion. The second story is about collaborating with our Indigenous communities, and we have always had representation on our board of directors to help guide us. With our support of Indigenous leaders coming together, we are now launching a youth program called Fueling Youth, which specifically addresses the call to action 88, 89, and 90 for truth and reconciliation. This program supports the call to action by uh, addressing Aboriginal athlete development and growth for the North American Indigenous Games, promoting physical activity as a fundamental element of health and well-being, reducing barriers to sport participation, increase the pursuit of excellence, and build capacity exclusive of Aboriginal people. COVID has delayed this launch for us. It is a free program, and I'm pleased to say that we're starting Saturday with 19 youth that represent 18 Indigenous communities in our interior region. With 10, That's a 10-week program. These are just two stories that outline the power of sport. Our passion continues in the belief that sport is a powerful vehicle that inspires youth, enriches lives, and builds community champions at all levels. 
Our PSI BC acronym reflects our commitment to partner, serve, inspire, build, and connect. Thank you for your support of the sports sector, and we look forward to our continued work building healthy communities to inspire and enable everyone to participate, play, and perform in a culture where everyone has the right to participate in a safe and inclusive environment. Let's build back better. Thank you. And I know I have um, provided um, our impact report that uh, came with uh, has some of the um, highlights just from our COVID year and, uh, and that. So... Thank you, Carolyn. Uh, so now I'll invite members of the committee to um, ask you some questions. Did you see? Gre did you see Greg? As <laughs> <laughs> one of many. Uh, did you catch the Olympics and Paralympics? Oh, fantastic! Great. Yeah. Thank and we're, you. And we're in School District 83. We're working with the physical literacy and the generalist teachers to help you know bring that movement along. Excellent. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So in 15 schools. Thank you Thank for you. your okay. uh, presentation. Oh, no, no, we have questions. Oh, oh we have questions. Okay, I thought, wow, I'm getting off. <laughs> Okay, well, thank you very much for your presentation. I know we, we heard from uh, your colleagues. sector uh, of the of the sector uh, wide ask, and I just want to thank you for your presentation and to hear about the wide uh, ranging ways that uh, organizations like yours impact uh, young and old alike uh, through their life, and uh, how we we kind of have a, a view in our province of trying to support people at all ages and abilities in sports. So thank you very much, and uh, I wanted to assure you that we have also heard from your, your colleagues too. Yes, so yes, thank you. Yes, for sure. Thank you for that. Uh, Mike. Thank you, Chair, and uh, thank you for your presentation. Um, I have to say that when, when Greg does what he does, you, you just absolutely pay it forward. And, and I, hope, I hope he realizes that that little effort that he puts out there goes miles and miles uh, for the youth that are out there. And I think everybody in this room will admit that that sport is, is, is something good for our youth because if, if it got something to do, uh, it's, it's taking away from something that they shouldn't be doing, maybe. Um, <laughs> my, my question to you is, is, with this funding that's there, what, will it, what do you believe it will do directly to your organization? Well, I think for us, we have 30% of our budget is provincial government funding right now, and 11% is gaming. Um, I think it really will advance those three pillars that I talked about with physical literacy, the sport development and sport performance side. I gave you the example of Greg and how it touches that sport development side. Um, the physical literacy side, we have th three school districts that we're currently working in for advancing that physical literacy side. So it's really increasing the... Um, what we're doing already and being able to go in those rural communities. We have 18 communities and, and we're, I wish we could be in every backyard. And so sometimes uh, we are, you know, sort of, uh, restricted by by the funding and we try and look to champions in the rural communities as well as the urban we are obviously our base is in Kamloops but uh, um, so it's just being able to do more looking at the five priorities we're already trying to be as affordable most of our programs are free or heavily discounted um, equity and inclusion is, is really big on our radar and um, our board is fully inclusive and uh, with representation on uh, gender and uh, indigenous as I mentioned and um, you know so I, I think that it's just, uh, it will advance us to really look at those priorities more collectively, and, and we're excited about, uh, you know, that, that work. Great. Thank you. Okay. Well, I think um, I don't see any other uh, questions. So on behalf of the committee, uh, Carolyn, I'd uh, like to thank you for making the presentation. Thank you for your enthusiasm. Oh, um, yeah. Others <laughs> have, uh, have presented to us. Um, about this, but you have so amplified uh, their message, and your stories are very powerful. So um, thank you for that. Thank, thank you. you I, I love what doing. I do. It's uh, <laughs> everyone says, "When are you retiring?" <laughs> Never. <laughs> I love it. So yes, thank you all for your dedication because okay. I know it's not easy. It's a long process. I have spoken before, and and uh, yeah, it's uh, it's nice to have the face to face. You were in Kelowna this morning, correct? No, tomorrow. Oh, we're that, in, uh, oh, oh, it's we in. Prince George. <laughs> oh, you're in Prince George, so Cologne is tomorrow. So you'll hear from my colleague, Shauna Taylor, tomorrow. So. Okay. Yes, yeah, she's wonderful. So anyways, thank you very much. Am I the last one? Yes, you are. Oh, good, yes. good, good. You, you now have earned your wine respectively, right? <laughs> so uh, a good note. <laughs> Look, they haven't even asked for a motion to adjourn, and here they are moving the motion, or voting. Um, all those in favor of adjourning. Okay, meeting adjourned. <laughs>